continue your life. Thank you. Okay, everybody ready to go? Okay. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the regular town commission meeting for February 9th. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes. Mayor Burkett? Here. Vice Mayor Paul? Here. Commissioner Salasauer, Mayor, just for the record, she texted me that she might be a couple of minutes. So she's absent. Commissioner Castle? President. Commissioner Velasquez? Here. Mayor, you have a question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, ask the commission if it's okay if we defer. Apparently, my items, um, several of my items, didn't have any backup in the agenda, and uh, I'd like that backup to be in the agenda. So, if it's okay with the commission, I'd like to move C. F, G, H, and I to the next meeting. I'm sorry, is that C, F? C, F, G, H, I. And this is in the nines? I'm sorry? Uh, this is in the nines? I'm sorry, this is what? Uh, uh, what section? Is it section nine? Discussion, section nine. yes, section yeah. nine. Okay. That's what I just want to know. And that's yeah. fine with me, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate that point. <clears throat> if, you'd, if you'd like to gather some more information for the memo, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Does yeah. anybody else have any uh, additions or deletions? Yeah, I'd like to propose that D, E, and V be taken out of discussion and just put into the hands of the town manager um, because these are all things either actively in progress or that the town staff has been waiting to proceed with. Um, the caps on the fences and the, um, the, the town document scanning. And then the code is actually part of the project that they're working on now. Okay, is there any objection to that? I'm good with that. Okay, very good. We'll do that. Anybody else? Yeah. Just to confirm, um, Commissioner Castle is 9D, 9E, and what's the next one? V is in Victor. V is in Victor. Uh, I'd like to also um, pull item 3E from the consent agenda and link it to 5C. Mm -hmm. And welcome, Senator Pizzo. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, what was that one, uh, 3E? Right, I'd like to pull that from the consent agenda and link it to 5C. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, so that's E, consent. I don't have a problem with that unless there's some administrative problem that you'd be unaware of. Oh, okay. Uh, the E is the um, the uh, uh, spending of money for that engineer. Is that what it is? Yes, what, it is. What, yes. what is E? Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine because um. Okay, okay. Tina, say it's it again. about the same thing anyway. Uh, okay, Tina, say it again. You wanted you want E to go where? I want to link it to five C. To five C. What do you see a 5C? 5C, 5C is, on page, is that the a, one on page? Uh, page four, six, page six. It's the Abbott Avenue Street Engineering. Okay. Yeah, right before Good and Welfare. Mm -hmm. And that's C also. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. E to 5C, okay. okay. Anybody else? Yes, Eliana? Hi, sorry I'm late. I'm gonna be in and out a little bit tonight. Um, I apologize. 
I would like to move item Z up, the traffic control devices on 88th Street, because there's been a lot of residents asking for that on um, general. Make a motion to do that, please. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to move item Z up on the agenda so that we can discuss it tonight. Is there a second to that? Uh, we're, I don't see where it's going, um, you know. Did you, did you need more? Did you need wait, more? Wait a minute. I'm waiting for a second. Patina, you had a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll second it. I just want to know where it's being moved to. Uh, after what? Um, we can move it after. You know, I don't know. After item B, after the social media item, or wherever you'd like. No, it's up to you. You're, I just want to. Oh, I mean, I'm. It's going. Uh, sure. I'd like to move it to after item after item B. So it would be item. It would be item C then. Okay. Okay, Matt, anybody else comment on that? Um, I'll comment. I think that item C, um, the conduct of meetings in the agenda is, has been a top item of importance that I've been waiting for for at least eight, nine months um, so that we can make our meetings more efficient. So I don't wanna bump that. Okay, we can move it to after that. I'll amend my motion to move it to after item C. Okay, um, the mayor uh, deferred item C, I believe. For Mm -hmm. so, so it would actually come before my item J at this time, and that's okay with me. Okay. okay. There's a motion and a second. Call the roll, Madam Clerk. Velasquez? Velasquez. Yes. Mr. Salsauer? Yes. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Burkett? Yes. Mayor motion. Okay, anything else? All right, next item is uh, Senator Pizzo, welcome. Thank you everybody, good evening. Good evening. From Tallahassee. I uh, just wanted to, to meet with you guys. I got a copy of the resolution. I, I had met with, uh, with Andy uh, over Zoom a couple weeks ago and I have your resolution for legislative priorities. I just wanted to, to know if you guys wanted any greater specificity or things to, to focus on more. Um, there's, there's been a doom and gloom scenario, obviously with a shortfall in the state budget. That's really just to preclude everybody from you know getting excited about more funding in the future. But I don't, I don't think it's as drastic or as dire as, as people say, as we're seeing more estimates come in, especially on certain sales have been very good, especially home sales have been, have been robust. So. I don't know if there's anything in particular on here um, as the legislative priorities. The one thing I would mention is item number one as it relates to the FAA Metroplex was this unsavory situation for everybody. May find um, me in a situation where I'm asking to side with one of my favorite children. And what I mean by that is I represent 15 cities and I'm trying to figure out as to Andy's giving a smirk. I think he knows what I mean. I'm wondering if to, to, to Surfside and North Miami's detriment, some other city has uh, asked or tried to exert some influence. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking into that. And I know that you guys have banded together or will band together with some other cities on, on that issue. Uh, but as it relates to other infrastructure, the good news is we, we've successfully uh, it, it gotten enthusiasm from, at, at a state level as it relates to infrastructure. The governor, unlike the last one, has finally recognized climate change, has started to make uh, not not overwhelming, but but market changes and 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 uh, financial assistance uh, to cities and to the county as a whole. So we should see more of that. DEP has a lot of money available, so does DEO. Um, a lot of you, I think a lot of you know that the transition from one house to the next. I stated at the residence in Marriott and was caught in the in the garage in four feet of water last year in, in, in your city. So, um, but other than that, uh, this year, Airbnb is back. Uh, we killed it last year, SB 1128. We looked to, to revise some parts of it as well to give you guys autonomy, uh, of course. And I'm really just happy to answer any questions or if there's anything, again, specific or greater attention or specificity you'd like on any of the legislative priorities, please. Great, thank you, Chad. Hi, Jason. Um, definitely item number three, the issues related to safety um, and walkability and heavy traffic on, uh, on the A1A corridor. 
as well as 96th Street. That would be my legislative priority for safety. Okay. Thank you. Eliana? Um, hi, Senator Bigelow, thanks for coming. I actually thought we were gonna talk about the legislative priorities at this meeting because there's something that we, first of all, I think home rule, which is number 12 on our priorities, I think that should be number one because our ability to be able to you know, protect our own community should be the number one thing because that affects everything else that we do all year. So I, I'm not sure whether what point in this meeting tonight we were gonna reset our legislative priorities or discuss it, but I think that's really important. And also there was an item from last year's that somehow didn't make it onto this year's, that's important. And last year it was one of the top things, which is land acquisition support for parks and open spaces. And that's something this commission has really been um, working on and would like to see happen. So if we can get funding for that or get support for that, that is important. Um, and that's something I'm gonna bring up later in the meeting to add to that legislative priority list. So it's not on the copy you have now, but hopefully okay. by the end of this meeting, it will be. Well, it's, it's, it's listed as number 12 under home rule. So I wasn't gonna mention it, but since you mentioned it, that's a priority. I'll go ahead and, and, and gloat a little bit. Uh, the Florida League of Cities gave me the home defender uh, of the of the year award, which is their highest honor out of 412 municipalities. Uh, so I, I will be happy to send you a list of bills that were about to come to you uh, that's, that died. Uh, and they include some very expensive revisions to your master plan that we prevented from happening. It would have been very costly to insert 14 lines of, of pleasantry and platitude that, that we argued to be unnecessary. The Airbnb bill, which I think I met with the property appraisers today. I don't think that they found it to be unfriendly because then they can click everybody off their homestead exemption if they're listing their properties for 60 days or more uh, and have greater revenue. But it's one of the, and I'm not a ribbon cutting kind of selfie photo kind of guy, I think you guys know, but I'm most proud of the bills you've never heard of because they never made it. Um, so I can, I can list a number of those that, that would have taken away a lot of your autonomy and, uh, and control. So I know it's listed as number 12, but commissioner, you should rest assured to know that, that, that I take it very seriously. The league just last week had me do a, a webinar for 156 cities uh, as it relates to effective communication with the legislature. So we take local home rule very, very, very seriously. The, the balancing and, re and reconciliation necessary in the coming months really is gonna be a lot of shortfalls that we may see in commercial tax revenue and how the state can aid and assist and fill some, you know, some stopgap measures. Also on environmental issues, uh, you saw with the Army Corps going, you know, uh, to Bell Harbor and the least expensive option was the sandbar and issues like that. But um, there's there's going to be money available. There has to be. Miami Beach was just awarded $14 million. I know you guys got a small amount of money, relatively speaking, but um, but Uber Aware and the whole region now is, is, is critically important. The governor, I will say, uh, I've been cautiously optimistic, but we're now two years in, so I have to give him credit. Um, in a very nonpartisan, very fair fashion. He is much more cognizant of home rule uh, than prior administrations. He really is. He's vetoed a lot of stuff that would have been uh, in effect. You guys have listed like single use plastics and plastic bags. Uh, there was a bill a couple of years ago that would have preempted you guys from doing that. And he really said, you know what, if, if that's what locals want, you know, if, if locals don't want it, the local electric can vote out, you know, their commissioners and replace them with other ones. But if that's a priority and it seems to pull well or and, and perform well, then so be it. So he, he has not interfered in a very micro level that others have, which is encouraging. Um, and as far as, far as uh, land acquisition and support, um, we are in the Goldilocks period to ask for things or to work on things as they relate to infrastructure and support. I'm on a pandemic preparedness committee about uh, things not to repeat and, and, and issues that we learned, cautionary tales for the future, uh, but but things outside of infrastructure will look like less than critical issues as it relates to funding. I just want to be really clear and, and, and temper expectations um, to reality that, that infrastructure is critical. We have 101,000 septic tanks, obviously not applicable to Surfside. And we also have an aged public sanitary system that's 60 year olds or, or more with broken clay pipes. And we're under a consent decree from the federal government from an EPA lawsuit and we, I, I'm of the opinion we should accelerate our default on that as a county level because we don't have uh, even close to having the schedule of repairs and replacement uh, that we're required to do. But as long as nice product keeps going up topically, the people are still flushing their toilets into, into old pipes that go to a public system. Uh, and that's got to change. And, and we finally have an administration that appreciates that, especially at the agency level. 
Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to make sure if it doesn't make we can put it on our list of priorities because what will happen is next year we'll base the priority list on this year. And if it falls off, then, you know, that's my concern. It's, it can be lower on the list of priorities, but I want to make sure that we do prioritize it. Thanks. You know? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I would like to say, though, as far as the um, plastic, uh, single-use plastic legislation, I believe we are preempted from, from that. We, we still are. Uh, it's only the straws, not the full single-use right. plastic. So I'd still so like to fight for that. Um, as far as infrastructure, for sure, let's go full speed with that. Um, and clean water, I believe, is also uh, still a big priority, just what you were saying, uh, Senator Pizzo, about the septic tanks. I'd also like to add to um, that one, the uh, to oppose oil drilling in Big Cypress um, National Reserve, because I just learned about that this, this weekend, that there are contracts for that, and I, I think it's a terrible idea uh, because it jeopardizes our water supply. So there, there is a, and what would seem sort of counterintuitive is, is how much money and resources uh, are, are being slated sort of to clean up Okeechobee, the water basin, Everglades restoration, the whole watershed, the, all the aquifers and all that. So it would seem counterintuitive. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic that those two will not be incongruent and that won't happen uh, is number one. But the second, um, I'm, I'm going to be very candid with you. The biggest pushback as it relates to single use plastics are from retailers. So the, 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 the straw issue is not a big deal in certain places. And it's not because of restaurants that were handing out straws. It's because a lot of things that are manufactured and sold at places like Publix have plastic, single use plastics attached to them. So it's really more on the retailer side than it is anything else. However, forgive me, I don't know if it's North Carolina or South Carolina, where there's uh, where they've outlawed plastic bags and single use plastics where there, where there are Publix. Um, and they just buy that. The state just had the political will to do it. And I said, that's it. This is what we're doing. Uh, and I, so it's not impossible, but there's a lot of resistance and pushback from, from the retail federation on that. So it's not really even a legislator thing. It's sort of legislators listening to, I only know how to be candid and straightforward. And I, lucky for you, your Senator is not subject to this, but you know, there are big campaign donors to a lot of my colleagues and, and they listen to what, what they're told. Good or bad, you're you're saddled with one who doesn't. So, thank you, Nelly. Oh no, I'm I'm just listening, but thank you very much, uh, Senator. Thank you for coming. Um, one of the things that we've been working on in this town is our flooding. We've got a really bad <coughs> issue with flooding, and you know, I I've been trying to bring attention to the fact that you know, while putting bigger pipes in the ground um, might move the water faster if you put big pumps in. Um, we, the houses are still going to get initially flooded. And the only way to really solve that problem is to actually raise the houses up. And we we're working on a pilot program right now. We've got the contractor in place. We're talking to the, uh, to a few of the residents that want to be like involved in a pilot program. And, uh, we'd love to, you know, we, we think we have enough funding to do a house or two, but, uh, we'd love to find a funding source so that we could do this on a much more regular basis where we can go up and down the street and basically give people the opportunity to raise their houses if they want to and be able to have the town um, help them do that in some form of a subsidy or a grant or a refundable grant or something like that. But, uh, you know, that that's something uh, that I'd personally like to see um, more of because at the end of the day, that's really the only thing that's going to solve the uh, rising seawater problem. Mayor, let me ask you, have, have you included or involved any insurance companies that might demonstrate or show an annual reduction in premiums based on raising the elevation of a home that over a 5, 10, or 15 year reduction in the premiums would, would help pay for that kind of cost? Well, actually, you know, the, the flood insurance is a government program and uh, there are discounts. Um, you know, the higher you go, the, the bigger right. discounts are. And I think that's a good point. And I had put together a, uh, a whole thing on my website, Surfside 2020, and a little video and basically sort of outlined, you know, the different discounts that one would get once their homes were sort of up and away out of danger. But right now we're, we're applying for a grant right now. We're looking for grants and, uh, you know, anything that you can do along those lines for us would be fantastic. Okay, and the, the other thing I would mention too is um, yes, I'll, I'll follow up on that point, but 
Yeah, a couple other ideas that I have, but understood. Great, uh, Eliana. Um, I sorry, I, I didn't know we were part of a pilot program, so I was confused by that. Um, we can talk about that. Maybe put it on the agenda. We can have a commission meeting because I wasn't aware that we were directing resources um, on a pilot program of some sort. So okay. I do know that you personally are an advocate for that tactic, but I don't think we discussed it as a commission. So I don't want us to use our legislative resources on something that hasn't necessarily. Well, let me, Commissioner, now that you've raised that issue, um, is it is shall we? You know, I'm going to poll the commission and ask them. Um, does anybody else want uh, the senator not to look for funding sources uh, that would help us fund raising houses in Surfside, like the Commissioner Salzhauer? We haven't discussed it as a commission. Okay, wait a minute, Commissioner Salzhauer. Conversation now. Sorry. Again, you're not going to monopolize the conversation. You can't add something to the agenda okay. that hasn't been right. on the agenda. Right. Again, again, you, I don't need to start muting you this early in the meeting, okay? You're adding an item to the agenda that hasn't been right. discussed. Right. Goodbye. Now, so the bottom line is yes, Charles. Sure. I, I just see that point as uh, one of the bigger picture items um, that uh, the senator spoke to um, that we may not have specifically addressed, but clearly going forward, you know, there are a lot of issues that are strained right now. <clears throat> you mentioned water, the environment, um, and I'm glad you just went directly into, you know, the old infrastructure for sewers because we are impacted in terms of a tourist destination, in terms of a home community, when the beaches are closed due to sewage, when Biscayne Bay is dead to fish um, because of no oxygen in the water. And that is something that we need to hit head on let us know if in any way we may not we may not have discussed that specifically as an agenda item, but certainly let us know, you know, through the town manager, if there's any way that we can help because I can speak for myself and I think I can speak for the commission, at least I would hope so, that we're very interested in, in doing those environmental uh, big picture things that will make this place sustainable in not just 10 and 20, but 50 and 100 years from now. Yeah, and, and I would I would mention not that it should be any unfair surprise. I, I was given a proposed resolution 2021 that was going to be discussed tonight, I believe from Madam Clerk. Uh, it had an attachment A with 12 listings of priorities and number 11 actually did include under resiliency and sustainability funding for raising homes and other initiatives. So um, including infrastructure improvements designed to mitigate sea level rise. Here's, here, here's the bottom line, and some, some of you may have certain interests or more specific or greater enthusiasm or less enthusiasm for one or the other. In 30 years, if we do nothing, we're all going to be underwater. So let's just pull from whatever basket, whatever silos, whatever tranches of funding are available. Some might come from state DEP, some might come from the federal government. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers might have a few million extra cubic yards of sand to dump around somewhere. So concurrently, we're, we're filing a legislative budget request for a couple technologies as it relates to, to beach restoration and sustainability. Uh, I, I won't even say sarcastically, you got a couple new residents that might take a very special interest in Surfside and it'll get, be getting a lot of attention pretty soon uh, that you should uh, prepare for, but I don't think in a bad way. Uh, and I think that you, you do have, I have some family friends that have now made a homestead in Surfside um, who, who are sort of very enthusiastic and very engaged civically. So. I think you guys are, should get should get and deserve to get a lot of attention. And whatever basket we can pull from available funds, you know, I was freaking out about Miami Shores and Biscayne Park and El Portal with the high water table rising within six inches of septic drainage fields when they're entirely on septic. And all of a sudden, Noah Valenstein calls me from DEP and says, "Listen, we got a little basket of money we can throw your way. Uh, we can sort of carve out areas." And obviously, if someone raises a home in Surfside and rebuilds it, they're not building it at the same elevation that it was built in 1941. I would hope. Right, it's going to be built a little higher. I'm also talking constantly to FPL, both from uh, those who are suffering perspective, unable to make it for utility bills, all the way to Alyssa. There's a couple extra dollars on your bill every month from FPL because we're all chipping into a trust fund for 50 billion dollars that's going to go underground each and every single person, business and homes, uh, utilities. And my point is, if you're already in the area and you're undergrounding and co-locating, why don't you just do it? Because eventually, Surfside was going to be on the on the schedule at some point anyway. And that's what we're doing and trying to do for Sunny Isles, uh, the same discussions we have with North Bay Village. But very often it, it, it includes getting everyone in the room. And we didn't find out until recently, everybody was like, it's FPL, it's FPL, it's FPL. It was actually AT&T that had a problem with co-locating uh, certain infrastructure underground. 
We also have to battle to the home rule, and I hate to be verbose, you know, loquacious and ornamental, but it's important to realize battling on the home rule front, you know, I was the only one in the, like the legislature, I think there's maybe three of us out of 160, I voted against a bill for 5G installation because it allowed subcontractors to run roughshod without getting necessary permits and going through the process, through your process locally, as well as not having to put up the necessary bonding. And they made false sort of, you know, a presentation saying that Sunny Isles was hard to deal with, Bay Harbor or whatever. I don't know if you guys know this, but Miami Beach had a puncture basically of their sanitary sewer lines with a million gallons of raw sewage that leaked from a subcontractor that never reported it. It was a police officer who saw something bubbling up. Well, guess what? The DEP went after Miami Beach, even though they had no longer had control all over this, and this can happen in Surfside, uh, and, and threatened to sue them. And then we got them to back off. We have a nice paper trail, just a warning. We understand this is why I was against the bill. But some back and forth politically between the mayor and the governor, and now all of a sudden it reopened and the DEP is suing Miami Beach for $2 million recovery of raw sewage on a pipe that was punctured by a subcontractor that they didn't want there in the first place and didn't even issue a permit to. So there's a lot of layers of bureaucracy and BS that, that, that floats around, and I just like to swim through it. because So there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. Great. Nelly? Nelly, can you hear me? Did you have your hand up? I think your screen is frozen. Nelly is very pensive. I think um, she's having um, internet connection issues. Oh, oh she's there back. she is. There she is. I see her. Nelly, you're up. If you can hear us. Having internet problems. No, I think I think you were discussing about the undergrounding of the power lines and uh, getting funding for that. That's something that's important for our town. Yeah, but Nelly, you're, Commissioner, you're, you're already paying for it. If you take a look at it, your FPL bill, you got a couple extra dollars on there, almost like a special assessment. It was a rate hike that the legislature agreed to and acquiesced to because the idea is for all of FPL's lines to eventually be underground at every municipality and county that they serve. And if, if my idea basically was, you know, Sunny Isles was underway with undergrounding almost the entirety of the span of the city save some single family detached areas and they're on the hook for another six million dollars and i've been sort of pushing them to insist say listen eventually we're all chipping into a trust fund into a kitty eventually everybody's going to be undergrounded if you're already under construction in a city just finish the rest of the undergrounding without paying the retail number and, and, and north bay village was had a had a contract outstanding with them to do the same and i'm like listen you're going to get around to it anyway but there are cities that will look to skip the line and still pay retail. And that's, they make a lot of money off it. The margins are huge there. But, uh, but you guys are paying right now, each and every single person on this call that lives in Surfside is paying right now a few dollars a month to a trust fund approved by the legislature to, to build a kitty to underground every city that, that FPL serves. So you're already paying for it. It's just about so, like, where's Surfside on the list? Exactly. Yeah. How are we going to get funding from this to underground our power lines? Okay, so it's, it's not funding that you need, you're already funding it. So I'll give you an example, okay? Right now we're all, you know, let's say there's 9 million FPL customers in Florida and everybody's paying two bucks each. So everyone's paying $18, $18 million a month, okay? That they're collecting, you know, over the course of the year, 224 million now. That money right now is going to areas that are of greatest need first. They've identified areas that, that need hardening. So there's probably places in the panhandle that got hurt, uh, hit by Hurricane Michael that they're going to underground first. There are other areas that might be super susceptible. And some of those can be identified to be Miami-Dade. It's, it's up to us to push them to say, listen, we're just as susceptible and sensitive and in danger as anywhere else. These are the coastal cities that should really be undergrounded now and hardened now and get them to do it. It's not funding. Funding is already there. They have the money for it. It's just a question of where you are on the schedule of, so, of cities. So they have the entire amount of money that we need to underground all our power lines? Is that what, that's what the, I'm the, trying to The volume and pace of funding coming to FPL based on monthly customer, commercial and, and residential customers, the money coming in outpaces their ability to construct underground. Okay, so I want to be clear that they, they can do, you know, it's a million dollars a mile. That's what it is. It, it's a million dollars a mile. Okay. And they are doing, let's say 15 miles a month, 
but they're bringing in $18 million a month from their customers just to pay for this as an aside. I assure you they did not put themselves in a situation where the pace of undergrounding exceeds the pace of the amount of, of the flow of finances coming in. Okay, you're all paying in advance. Okay, we're all on layaway right now. We're all paying layaway for, for one day to be undergrounded. Okay. Okay, Eliana. So I have a follow-up question for that. Why were we not aware of that? And why did FPL come in here and try to sell us on this? And why are we paying $60,000 to get an estimate on that? And and looking to borrow tens of millions of dollars to do this when FPL needs to do it legally and has the money and we're already paying for it. I feel like we were sucker, being suckered. Well, Andy and I actually spoke about this a few weeks ago and I, you know, I know it seems de minimis, but by the time that if you guys want, and this is why I said it earlier, if you want to go retail, they're happy, they're happy to go ahead and send their sort of retail arm to go do the undergrounding right now. Okay. And you'll pay retail for it. Now, does it seem like a, a huge treat? No, but if, if if the shovel goes in the ground and it's done, let's say 36 months from now, the one thing you could reasonably ask for <clears throat> is a rebate for every one of your customers, every one of your residents to say, listen, the $3, two or $3 a month times six, 7,000 over the course of 36 or 48 months is not a small change, okay? So, so you can actually sort of skip the line with the separate retail division and get undergrounded let me give you a for instance. If I'm building a brand new commercial park somewhere, I'm going to tell FPL I want it undergrounded from the tie-in all the way to me. I don't want to do anything overhead, right? I'm going to pay one of their su approved subcontractors or vendors to underground all of that utility. I'm going to do it with my T1 lines, with you know, with cable, electric, water, so everything's going to be underground, okay? Because that's you know newest and best practices. But if everybody just waited and we all lived in a vacuum, which we don't, I know. But if everybody waited their turn and their turn meaning when FPL prioritized you based on flood areas, impacts, storms, you know, all these things, Surfside might be town number seven or might be town number 70 or town number 170 on their list. When they get around to it, you're paying nothing. If you wait till they get around to you, you're paying nothing. But that could be four years from now. That could be seven years from now. You, you follow 2030, I think. 2030. One of my roommates is actually a Republican senator over here from the West Coast in Tampa. I think it's 2030 is their schedule. They want to be done by 2030. So everyone will get undergrounded without spending any money by 2030. Correct. You're spending it already. So but, but, years. but nine years from now, everyone will be underground. That's that's the schedule. But there are there are some time value of money scenarios where some cities and some areas don't want to risk waiting that long because the risk of loss is far greater or, or the issues you know, are, are far greater. Have any other towns successfully been able to get out of having to pay this monthly tax if they paid themselves to underground their own lines? Or are they still paying because it's a, it's a pooled amount of resources and you can't just opt out? It, it's, a, it's a pooled amount of resources and, and I, I, I would shudder to think I'm probably the only one that thought that they should at least get a rebate. Have they, has anyone gotten a rebate though, or that's not going to happen? None of none of our cities have, but but I assume the not, not I don't assume the ones that they're undergrounding right now have only been paying small amounts for a short amount of time, and they're already getting service. They're already getting how, customer service. How do we find out what number of Surfside is on the list of priorities? Who has that list? Christopher Christopher uh, Ferreira is that his name? Christopher who took over for. Yeah, oh, uh, Christopher should. Christopher, I'll get you. I'll, I'll get you. You know the real number of where they are. You are in a list, but he should make that available to you. Okay, that would be great. Can we have the town manager um, get that information that post haste so we know, or we waste more time and money on this? And mm -hmm. can we spend money to get ourselves moved up on the list with lobbying or such? Okay, so I, I'm going to I'm going to say you you probably can, but but not with my blessing and not and not with my participation. Okay. But, but remember, there's concurrent paths. One is to go retail. Okay, Sunny Isles did it. They're like, listen, we're spending $25 million of our own money to, to open up the roadway. And this is what they got pissed off about AT&T trying to do the 5G wherever they wanted. And this is why I voted against it. AT&T came to my office and they're like, listen, some of your cities are being very difficult, Senator. We'd like to put 5G for everybody and give them, you know, everything's going to run on 5G and we're all going to wear the same uniforms and flying cars. Now, 
I said, listen, let me just ask my cities. <clears throat> I'm not saying you're lying or it's a reason. Let me ask my cities. AT&T emails me back right before a committee meeting, copying their attorney and says, Sunny Isles has been impossible. Aventura won't give us a permit. Bay Harbor Islands asks us for a $250,000 bonding fee in Miami, in Miami Beach is being difficult also. So I went back to the city managers. I said, what's going on? Chris Rooster from Sunny Isles. No, Senator, we spent $25 million. We gave all the utility companies 18 months notice to co-locate with us. And they basically said, go pound sand. We're going to get this done in Tallahassee and put these wherever we want. I called Aventura, I talked to Ron Wasson. Ron, what's going on? Why won't you give him a permit? Well, Senator, that's not true. Uh, uh, Maztec went ahead and cut our lamp line and they won't pay for the repair of it. We're not going to give them anything un until they repair our lamp line. That was the situation with that. I talked to JC over at Bay Harbor Island, city manager, I go, what's going on? Why aren't you getting, what's wrong with your, with your crazy and exorbitant bonding fee? $250,000, he goes, no, Senator, it's $25,000. That's not accurate. So the next committee meeting, they come up and at and there and they go, uh, we wave in support. I go, no, 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 you put in an appearance card. I'd like, the, I'd like the attorney, you know, the guy with the bar license to come up to the podium and answer a few questions for me. And I flat out asked him, I said, sir, you're on this email copy to me, right? Yes, where you list the problem with Aventura, Bay Harbor Islands, all this. Okay, are you aware? I spoke to my, my, my city managers and my mayors and this is you know, what they found. I go, please don't ever let your name be put on something that's not accurate and true. And for that, I'm a no vote. I got an F from the Florida Chamber of Commerce on their report card because I voted no in committee meetings and no on the floor. Everybody else voted yes. My concern was that they were going to rip into lines, rip into sanitary sewer lines in areas that are frankly and objectively more environmentally sensitive for my cities than they are for other ones. Ocala does not have the environmental concerns that I do for Biscayne Bay, you do for flood. It, it just, that, that's the case. And my concern as well is how do you hold them accountable for even maintaining the current lines that we do have? Because they've already showed that they're not, they're not really taking care of the stuff that they do have. I don't know why you do business with a company that doesn't already. Who do you think, who do you think owns most of the poles that you see that, that all the overheads own? AT&T. AT&T, not, not FPL. Yep. Not FPL. And who owns the property that the poles are stuck into? The surf sides. <laughs> So why can't we hold ATT accountable to come out and fix them, replace them? I mean, this so should not we, cost anything. So as I was telling Andy a couple of weeks ago, we had a meeting at North Bay Village and I brought to the table and on a lot of your issues, I, I'd like to bring Tallahassee down to you, especially FDOT as it relates to pedestrians and bike lanes and safety and stuff, bring the secretary down. But as Andy and I were talking about a couple of weeks ago, um, this <laughs> It was an interesting exercise that at, at a table inside of City Hall, we had AT&T, Comcast, FPL, and somebody else. And we're like, all right, whose lines are they? And everybody went like this. And everybody went like this. And everybody went like this. I said, at the very least, we're not gonna agree on any kind of term sheet or anything like that. Let's just figure out by the conclusion of this meeting, who owns what, who's responsible for what, and why things aren't getting done. And it turns out AT&T owns the polls, but FPL won't let anyone co-locate next to them within, I think it's 12 or 24 inches. So even though you're opening, you're trenching something, FPL doesn't want you anywhere near anyone else because they want to be able to accurately identify where they're like, for whatever reason, maybe it's good practices, maybe it's legitimate, I don't know. But everybody was going like this. And I asked, like, even anecdotally, I'm like, when's the last time you guys were all in the same room together? They're like, mm, never, never in that kind of situation. Those That's are important, really it seems simple, but it's important. And we're having a lot of, we had a situation this, okay. this week with that, with yeah. the line that yeah. someone got hurt. We're gonna and, do some other, oh, the oh. vice mayor, hold on a second, Nellie. The vice mayor has had her hand up. Go ahead, vice mayor, and then we'll get to Nellie. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to thank, thank Senator Pizzo for uh, going against the 5G. Thank you very much for that. Um, but uh, just to um, get go back on the uh, FPL issue, I did speak with uh, Christopher Ferreira about a year ago, and um, we, we, I don't know where we are in the schedule, but he had said that uh, I believe it's um, every three years they're supposed to underground a certain amount of uh, footage in each town, and it's, it is a 30-year plan, though. So um, that's what I heard, 30 years. Not, I mean, years isn't bad, but I was hearing 30 years, and every three years they'll do something. I, I, I think it's 30, 36, every three years or 36 months, a, a certain distance, whatever. Uh, and I think it's. It was 20, 30 for, for a, a firm master plan on the issue. 
I'll get I'll, I'll get this I'll get the specifics of it. I, I honestly think this is a situation where not going it alone, you should do something on a regional level. I think from Golden Beach down to the South Beach, like one one stop shopping, <clears throat> economies of scale, purchasing power. You know, I, generally generally it makes sense to me that if everyone's going to be in the area, they might as well do it. Uh, Nelly. Uh, yeah, no, I wanted to um, say that, you know, we have this big problem with AT&T with their cables all over the place. And I remember a couple of months back <clears throat> that we tried to um, get the town manager to find out exactly, not you, Andy, this was way before you, um, that he would um, contact FP, um, AT&T and the cable companies to come in and take out all the unused cables that are all over the place. This is why our town looks like a spaghetti string all, all, all over all over town. And, and it's not just the electric lines. It's mostly these cable companies that are coming in here and they keep rewiring these the houses and then they leave all the garbage behind and they don't take out anything. As a matter of fact, uh, the other day, one of our residents was hit by a cable. Um, I thought it was an electric line, but it turned out to be that it was a cable. Uh, uh, a uh, telephone um, at and line. So those are important things that we, if, if there's a way that we can get them to um, come in here and clean up their mess before we're giving them permits to anything. I mean, these the, they, they're making an enormous amount of money off of all our towns and we need to start cleaning up. A lot of, the, a lot of those are subcontractors. I, I know it seems like shaming and doxing. I'll tell you what is effective and I'll put them up for like five or 10 minutes until they serve their purpose and then I take them down. I take pictures of things and tags and tag companies on Twitter. You'd be amazed how fast of a response you get from huge companies, huge. And you know what they do? They have an algorithm. They basically have bots that follow this stuff. And like, you know, during the unemployment crisis and the throes of it in the middle of last year, I just tagged Marriott and saying, how come we don't let people just donate to a pool to house some people, you know, to get through on a housing, boom, 30 seconds, they responded. And you know what they do? They go, all right, whose account is this? Oh, wait, it's got a blue check. Oh, it's a government account. The town of Surfside can do a lot. Just say, listen, Comcast, please be more responsible. AT&T, please, please come help our residents. I assure you, if that's from the town of Surfside's Twitter account or Instagram account, you will get immediate customer service. They don't want that stuff going viral. Thank you. And, that's, and that doesn't cost anything. Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> My last two comments. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because so many of our big issues are tied into regional, state, and national level issues. And it requires that kind of coordination, um, you know, including COVID, which is still, you know, alive and with us here. Um, but um, so I really appreciate that. And I'm, I know we can do better with communication because sometimes we feel like we're, um, we're an island, at least I do. Um, in terms of finding resources, you know, even resources for say affordable native plants that you know that are drought tolerant and um, and and uh, resistant to our conditions. Um, the I remember the town resources said, "Oh, those are very expensive. They're at specialty nurseries, and they're very expensive compared to what you find at the regular retail outlets." Um, but lastly, talking about FPL, um, if you ask me, they seem to be doing the same thing with the solar initiative where they're asking residents and businesses to, to sign up, to contribute, to pay up front for different solar projects, if you read the details of it. And, um, and to me, that's just not fair if we're gonna give power to, um, to a utility as a monopoly. Thanks. Senator, um, I wanna, first of all, thank you. This has been an extremely productive discussion. And I, I invite you to come more often because uh, we're learning things tonight that I don't think any of us really knew. I wanted to follow up on uh, something we were talking about with respect to uh, the undergrounding. You know, uh, FPL had basically uh, intimated to me when we were discussing with them that we had a choice, that uh, they were gonna harden the infrastructure. And by that, they meant they were gonna put up concrete poles. But if we wanted, we could pay a little extra and put the stuff underground. Now, I've been listening to what you've been saying and it, I, you know, did I hear right? Did I hear that they're not going to be putting up concrete poles anymore, and that they're going to be putting everything underground? Or no, no, but but and 
No, not at all. They may, they may be hardening, and that's actually good news. So if you saw me smirk, it's because that's actually good news. And basically what they're saying, and you know who does this? FDOT does this a lot. They go, and they just did this to Biscayne Park. They go, listen, we owe you guys new streetlights. This is the sta this is the standard model that we provide. It's kind of like when you're buying a house or kind of whatever, like this is the standard fridge and standard appliances. But if you want to upgrade, if you want to upgrade, we can offer you the upgrades and we can get you, you know, our price on it. And so if they're telling you that they're looking at concrete poles and they're giving those to you, they owe them to you and they're coming, they're forthcoming at no cost. To me, that's intimating, listen, we're, our budget's basically six hundred thousand dollars for for a mile. You guys kick in four hundred thousand dollars and make up the difference. Well, they did. And, say and you'll get the undergrounding right away. To, to be fair, they did say that, and I think that we've we, yeah we've we've got a consultant that is uh, that's that's looking at all the numbers and hopefully going to give us the true story on exactly but, what. But but F, F dot does the same thing. They go, listen, we have to do new street lights. These are these are the standard poles that you get, but if you want to pay extra for a greater lumens, better candle, nicer, you know, uh, shade whatsoever, you guys can pay the difference. This is sort of like, you know, the base that we're giving you. If, if they're going to concrete, are they, did they say anything about raising transformers, like 24 to 36 inches off the ground? That should also, that should also be a, a standard operating thing too, because the, in flooding areas, you want those transformers off the ground. Listen, I know, like Andy said, I know it was an extreme event. I just happened to be there the weekend that the flooding was so bad, you know, coming off Collins and meeting on the other side. And we were trying to like knock on people's doors to have them move their cars. We were lifting motorcycles and the the, the guy behind the front desk was like, do you work in the city or something? I'm like, kind of, not really. Don't worry about it, let's keep on moving. Um, but yeah, those things should be raised also. If they're gonna bring concrete for hardening, they're bringing, they're bringing you a credit. Right. What about the, what about the part you said? I love the part where you said, "Listen, we've been paying into the fund. Um, they're not have, they're not going to have to spend the money on us. Um, it'd be nice to know how much we've actually paid into the fund, so that we can use that as a negotiating tool um, when we talk to them. Do we know when that fund started, or can we find out? Yeah, it was it was approved last year, and it either went effective July first because they have to. They basically came in for for uh, not even so much a rate increase, but a separate line item. So, how about this? I commit and promise to come back to your next month's meeting because we'll be like right in the first part of session to know what the bad and the good bills are. Uh, by then, I would ask each of you for a small humble homework assignment. Grab your FPL bills, and take a look at that separate line item. And then basically you can take a look at average usage and some of your commercial properties and see what they're paying. And then we'll know. And then you basically get like a month. Chris should be able to tell you what does Surfside represent to FPL on, on a monthly basis? Just literally every single meter, what, what it's paying and what's being charged for this separate trust fund, you know, for, for underground insulation, extrapolate over a year's time. And if you don't get this installed in, let's say the, the schedule's three years until completion, Multiply however many months have passed since its inception, you'll know what you guys paid in. Excellent. Now, the earlier you go, the, the less expensive it is, obviously. Excellent. Excellent. But it doesn't, it won't stop. Yeah, it won't stop because we've got, we're all paying. It's just that we got ours a little sooner. The sooner you get it, you realize the time value of money. If you guys have collectively paid in only $100,000 as a city and business in the aggregate, and you get $7.5 million worth of undergrounding, you basically got free money advanced to you until your amortization schedule might be six years from now by the time you paid up the amount you would have paid retail for it. So obviously the sooner the better. But I don't wanna say it's not your money, it is. It's every one of your residents that are paying for this. Okay, Benelli? I guess I just wanted to find out if there's any um, grants from the state that we can get um, towards this particular um, undergrounding of the power lines. The answer is going to be no, because I mean, I mean, maybe there is, but the short answer is no, because it's already in motion. That they, they reduced everyone's pro rata share into contributing to this statewide at the lowest possible amount, which is your individual household usage, um, as as sort of a a, a a mini special assessment, so to speak. So the funding is already there. And they're going to say, listen, there's only so many of us. We North do use Bay subcontractors, but didn't, we'll get around to you when we get around to you. Didn't North Bay Village get like $11 million? 
from the feds, yes, from FEMA. Yeah. From FEMA, um, yeah. Okay. How do we, I mean, a grant like that from FEMA? But what I suggested to North Bay Village was don't assume you're going to, not say blow, but spend it all on the FPL issue because you want to underground other stuff, not just FPL, right? You you also want to do telephone lines. Yes, the whole data. thing. Yeah. Now that's that's what sort of sparked the meeting on, well, if you're going to run cable, electric, phone, you know, all of that through the $11 million, you know, listen, if you're going to, if you're going to open up a trench and co-locate other stuff, that kind of entices or should entice FPL to be like, all right, listen, if you're opening it up already, okay, then, that then, then it makes sense for us to go in there also. I, I just didn't want North Bay Village to commit to spending it all on FPL. I thought they could have gotten something for it without having to commit those dollars. Very good. Very good. Okay. We're going to go around again, folks. I have a question for Senator Pizzo. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, the, so because uh, Vice Mayor thought it was a thirty-year plan, but you're saying it's a tw it's twenty thirty is the deadline. No, it's it's twenty thirty for for a fixed design. I, I think it is a thirty-year build out, but it should never obviously take that long. So I'm probably being very optimistic, but okay, call it call, it, can, call it thirty years. Got it. And we can actually find out where we are on that list. A uh, similar issue for our residents has been sort of the traffic and the cut through and all that stuff. And we're kind of in the middle of a little bit of a battle with the county because um, some residents complained they didn't like the stop signs. And because we had put them in without county per permission, the county made us remove them. Now the residents are all upset. It's one of the items on our agenda for the meeting tonight. Um, and so the, the, the concern is, you know, the residents want their stop signs, but then to put them back is defying the county. We're not looking to make trouble but we also need to keep our residents safe. So how do how do we um, navigate that and what can you do to help us navigate that? Well, let's In certain let's sections see. of Biscayne, there were things that were approved um, that the county was, was honest with the local residents that wanted things. Like there's a very strong coalition of people um, interested in pedestrian bike safety in Biscayne, especially stretching from like 36 up to 79. We hear from them daily that they're, they're really engaged. They, they got, partially what they wanted, uh, but not the supplies. And Alice Bravo from the county was honest. She's like, listen, these things are on back orders. It's like the strip lights, you know, that whatever. But there's nothing precluding, if you get the approval to do it, to go ahead and supply uh, the components that, that you're looking to put in there. But yeah, you would think, and for many years, you know, one of my representatives, the state representatives underneath me has gotten away with putting up a sign that says where his office is and looks very official. They don't make those anymore. So he had that handmade, but I, I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, call it in and have it removed, but yeah, you were doing something in the interest for, for quality of life, for health and safe, for public safety. You would think it'd be easier to ask for forgiveness than it would be for permission, but there are very often where they're on back order and stuff or the, the funding hasn't come through. Listen, FDOT's the worst. And I mean that affectionately. They have a three-year planning schedule on a project followed by five years of a funding schedule. So when they like public notice things that they say, oh, we want to commence, you know, the project, it's an eight-year window. That's what happened with the overpass of Ives Dairy. And I argued, listen, if, if it's going to take eight years, why don't you just lease back the property to these people for a dollar a year until you put a shovel in the ground? But the short answer to your question is, you tell me where you think it, where, where, where the issue is, uh, and is it FDOT or is it county? County. Okay. So, uh, uh, Senator, before you go, I had a question. Do you have any recommendations on how we could go about getting those FEMA grants for the houses, for the flooding, for the undergrounding? Yeah, Andy's going to get uh, an email uh, tomorrow if you didn't get it today. Uh, they've announced a couple other sort of tranches of some block grant money, so to speak, from the state as it relates to uh, the infrastructure and environmental stuff. But as it relates to FEMA, um, yeah, you should really invite, he's very accessible, but you should really invite like Noah Valenstein down from DEP just to come take a visit. Okay. And, and if, if he's resistant to it, then I, I can set up three city visits to make it worth his while. They like to get on the road. Nobody wants us to be stuck up here in Tallahassee. Okay. So invite him down. I invited the FDOT secretary from Tallahassee. He came down to FIU. We invited all cities to come. I brought down Department of Banking Professional Regulation secretary for condos to Aventura City Hall. 200 people showed up. 
So just just invite them. It's like asking you know the pretty girl to the prom. The worst that she can say is no. Got it, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes, just I just wanted to uh, touch on the traffic issue because a lot of it is F dot in terms of um, our Collins Harding corridor. We have really poor lighting. Uh, we were promised crosswalks uh, with the, I believe it was with the flashing lights. I'm not sure. We've gotten some crosswalks. They don't have the flashing lights. Um, and these things were on the table and approved and we were supposed to get them like over a year ago. But if they were approved, uh -huh. if they were approved, just ask if you can go ahead and, and have someone install them and get reimbursed for them or recapture what, 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 what the installation cost was. There's a value to that. I know the county was receptive to do that, I believe, on, on Biscayne Cor Corridor, if I remember correctly, but like the stuff was on back order. But, you know, the other thing you got to balance, you, you ask, you know, yourself as a commission, your city attorney, your city manager, like if you're aware of things and you have a, a real concern, as I have for many other cities, if you guys are acting in good faith and just trying to protect public safety and quality of life, just just copy me, go ahead and do it, and I will fight like hell against anyone who gives you a hard time. Yeah. And, and shame them if, if, if you didn't follow correct administrative procedure while you were trying to save lives. I mean, seriously. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Eliana. That's actually a good point, because uh, I had a question about what more we can do about the masks. Um, and the COVID issue because Surfside, I don't know if you saw, but the it's like a, it's like Mardi Gras over there with no masks. Uh, you so think I, as far as as far as mandates, the governor has preempted and precluded anyone from enforcing a fine or fee. But I will tell you that a very close friend of mine, uh, asking what he could possibly do to help out, donated one million masks to me a few weeks ago. So I, I will invite. Uh, I don't know if I, I I didn't have it in hand when at last I spoke to Andy. But if you want to send Chief or any of the uh, police department guys over to the uh, Operation Emergency Center for the county at Frank Rollison's in Medley, I can have a, a pallet of 20,000 masks put in a truck for you, and you can have them at Surfside and hand them out to your residents. Great. Thank you. For I'll, that. I'll put it this way. To be selfish for the, for the district, nobody in Surfside should say that they can't get a mask. And I, and I know that you guys unfairly get... The you guys have deep pocketed. Everyone's rich. Everyone's fantastic, and on the cover of Vogue magazine and Surfside, and we know that's not the case. Right. So we're mindful right. of that, and so we'll make those available to you. And the, the hotels, I think, because it's a lot of tourists. Nelly, right? But some of the hotels are actually offering. I just read about it today. Especially my, are offering testing uh, to guests when they come in. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say that most of the people that weren't wearing masks were visitors they're not really residents or residents are actually being very good they're following the mass rule um it was more of a visitor thing tourists coming into town um that's why i feel very strongly that we need to have that digital sign so we can further uh, put out the information of the masks and other information for our residents and for visitors and i think um I think our town manager also contacted uh, the hotels and uh, condos and made sure that they keep their um, visitors informed of our mask mandate. But it was mostly, like I said, tourists. Um, our residents have been very good so far. Thank you. It, it's bittersweet because you need the tourism dollars, but. Uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just because we're speaking about COVID now, uh, we've had issues with our residents not being able to get the vaccine, those who want it. And they are over well over 65, some of them. And, uh, you know, our, we've tried to intervene and have, uh, we have town staff that are calling uh, to try to get, you know, the, calling the residents and trying to help them make the appointments because some of them don't, you know, not, not everyone's connected to the internet when you get to the elderly residents. So this has been an issue. And then some of them, are compromised, so it's difficult for them to go to these places and especially to travel to Hard Rock. And I even had a couple who called me and they could get appointments, but not together. So then they're supposed to drive separately. It doesn't make sense. And I just want to, you know, we want to follow the rules and, and help our people that are over 65 get the vaccines. And, and many of our residents haven't gotten them. So I see the county focused mostly on the underprivileged areas, but you have areas that just have the elderly population and they're not being taken care of. So we, we tried um, late last year to, to find out who would be amenable to be a sort of an open source area. So we contacted Miami Jewish Health that was amenable to it. Uh, Mount Sinai tried. 
Aventura Hospital as well. Uh, I, I will tell you candidly, I, I was very concerned and I wanted to make sure I didn't want a stupid virus to take down our Holocaust survivors. So I actually helped arrange the coordination and for, for our Holocaust survivors uh, to be vaccinated. Mount Sinai came through, Miami Jewish uh, tried. <clears throat> it, it is a supply issue. And what came out in the news today is, okay, it's a supply issue and we're focused on 65 year olds, but we're not getting our proportionate share of the five or 600,000, 65 and over we have in Miami-Dade County. We're not getting our proportionate share that other counties are getting for the 65 and over crowd. It is a supply issue. There was some back and forth between the state and the new administration, uh, presidential administration uh, a couple weeks ago, where at a press conference, Jen Psaki said, well, you should ask Florida why they're only using 54% of their uh, of their supply. Well, we're using 54% because in a lot of areas, and our Jared Moskowitz is our emergency management coordinator came before a committee and explained, listen, in one week, we got 500,000 doses. In the following week, we got 260,000 doses. If you vaccinated 500,000 people the first week, all of a sudden you were finding out you weren't guaranteed to be getting that same matching 500,000 for their second vaccine a few weeks out. So yeah, there was some, there was some of that. We had a lot of vaccine tourism. I was given firsthand accounts of people flying in on private jets and getting vaccines and flying out of here. Um, I have asked only for uh, one terminal brain cancer patient who's not in my district in, in, in the Southwest area in the Kendall area, a couple of other homebound people um, but I even told my mom and dad, you know, they didn't ask, they would never put me in that situation, but it's just not happening uh, for them, unfortunately. You know, I mean, that's the situation we're in. I haven't asked to skip the line or anything. And I have publicly said I should be the last to get vaccinated because you taxpayers pay for fantastic health care for me. Daniela Levine Cabot is trying very, very hard to be as ecumenical as possible. We also have an information campaign that, we're, that we have to undertake. We have a huge percentage of the population in Miami-Dade County that would reject the offer of a vaccine based on a number of historical factors. The other day, I, you know, I had to explain to some people about this, the Tuskegee Airmen experiment from 1932 to 1972. You know, we, we, we purposely injected syphilis you know, in, in, into people as experiments. And even though penicillin was widely available by 1947, we ran out of the money for treatment for that when we continued to do it. There is a huge swath of our population in Miami-Dade County that, that offered to get, to get the vaccine rejected, well, don't want it. It's as high as 50% in the military, don't want it. So the situation becomes precarious when you have a place like Miami Jewish Health, let's say with 1200 beds, if 50% of the staff doesn't wanna be vaccinated, we never get to 100%. We never get to take your mask off. We don't get there because we can't force people to be vaccinated. And that's a serious, serious problem. So to be mindful of something, don't take the 4.6 million 65 and over in Florida and say, you know, we have to vaccinate all of them. Not all of them will take it. And then we would come down to the next ring, not all of them will take it either. I'm concerned about teachers. I think teachers should get it. We're, we're making them go back to the classroom. You know, they should get it. I can stay in an office, Charles. Charles, which leads Sorry, to the to mayor. I apologize. question. Um, in the beginning, the CDC prioritized essential workers, um, those at the front line uh, of retail, et cetera, that, that face the risk of COVID multiple times every hour, if not every minute. Um, but yet we haven't heard anything about essential workers now. I too am waiting and prioritizing my parents up in St. Lucie County who are still on, have, on signed up on everywhere they can be on the web, but don't have any information about when or if they'll even get it at this time. But what about essential workers? Are we ever going to get to them? We are. Um, we. I, I. I don't mean to be flippant, but I have a Republican about ten feet away from me here. Um, we're gonna. We're gonna take care of Republican super voters first. Okay, it's just that's just reality. I'm not even. I'm joking with him because he's here. But it just so coincidentally happens to be rural uh, red counties in Florida that you know they got it before uh, Palm Beach and Broward and, and Miami did. No, but. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. I think the person who uh, you buy a cheeseburger from at the counter who's seeing 110 people a day in a shift is far more susceptible and sensitive. What, what they carve out and forget is a single exposure. If a 70-year-old person who's homebound, 75, 80-year-old person is homebound, has one interaction with one person a day, and you talk about the percentages, the transmission, whatever, 
but if the if a 25 year old person has 100 exposures a day, forget what what who's more sensitive and susceptible. The 75 year old doesn't have the 100 exposures a day, right? You put a 25 year old, they're going to have those th those kinds of exposures. I would also tell you, to be honest with you, and I think most of you know this, Miami is not Florida. Large parts of Florida have canceled COVID. Okay, if you go to anywhere where I, around where I am right now, nobody's wearing a mask. Nobody, like nobody is wearing a mask. And it's been like that since we came home March 18th from session. I came back up here for unemployment to get in the face of the governor's office and DEO April 21st. And we stayed through June. We took, my kids came up for a little bit. So we took like a three day out to the panhandle. Nobody's wearing a mask. Nobody. It's, it's a Miami, Broward, Palm Beach thing. Nobody's wearing masks. I don't know if you guys saw the streets of Tampa the other night after the Super Bowl game. Several thousand people closely crowded together. Nobody's wearing masks. Nobody. And so my sort of position is behind the scenes, I've been telling people like, listen, if you guys really don't give a crap about this, and you're not taking it that seriously, just send the supply down to us. You know, we, we do, we take it seriously, but that's the truth. COVID's canceled. We're, we're, we're required in committee meetings to wear our masks. And if you watch a committee meeting from like today, everybody's got their mask off after five minutes. Like I forget this inside of a building, your state legislators. Okay. Um, anybody else with questions? For the senator? Yes, Eliana. Just the follow up. Is there anything, I mean, outside the box or anything you can think of that we can do to um to move the needle on any of this? I mean, other than the messaging that we're doing and, and handing out masks and such, but it's because we're all until everybody takes it seriously, we're all at risk. This is gonna go on forever. I mean there there, there are two there are two points that are moving at a, at a faster clip and they're, they're running parallel with each other. The vaccine supply is going to increase, okay? And the number of vaccine and different types of vaccines with Johnson and Johnson coming out, AstraZeneca, those are also going to increase. Broward County, Mayor Geller honestly believes that everybody that wants to be vaccinated will be vaccinated by May. Now, I think that contemplates, I talked to Joe, his brother, I think that contemplates probably a 35% rejection rate. But everybody that wants to be vaccinated will be vaccinated by May. Uh, it's a supply issue. We don't have COVID deniers at the national level so that that supply is, is gonna be available. So I, I honestly hope by June. Thank you. Uh, Nellie. Um, yes, my question is um, you're mentioning that there's a lot of places outside of just our area that are not wearing masks. Now, how are their numbers in terms of you know, hospitalizations and infections and things like that, because if people are not wearing the mask and what, what's going on over there. So I like to show people when they're in my office, this map that I made that actually uses everyone's, every Senator's surname in the shape of their district. Uh, and so when you look at the map of Florida, it's everybody's name in the shape of their district. You have to take a magnifying glass to see mine because my 560,000 constituents fit into a very small, very tiny part of Florida. And then Senator Albritton has like half of the center of Florida because it takes that much land area to make up the same 560,000 constituents. Some of these people live a half mile to a mile away from each other. They don't live in high rise condos in crowd closed areas. There aren't a lot of live nightclubs and cool hot spots, South Beach spots outside of Miami. So we draw a lot of people that aren't from here. They they super spread, and like you said, like like bad sailors, they just they leave you know bad stuff behind when they go. And there's there's social distancing and separation and all that stuff just by the product type of the physical plant and structure of other lo, you know localities in Florida. If you go to the Panhandle, like Grayton Beach, 30A, their sort of summer spot of beaches is just Santa Rosa Beach. It's just spaced apart, not no one's on top of each other. But if you're on spring break, you're not thinking about going, you wanna to come to Miami, you wanna to come to South Beach. Okay, anybody else? Senator, thank you very much. It thank was very much, it was Senator. informative. We really appreciate you coming. Yeah, I'm happy come to come back and get some updates. every month, this is great, thanks. No, I'm, thank I'm, happy, you, I'm Senator. happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. Thanks guys. Take care, be well. We'll right. see you next month. All right, great. Okay, is there a motion to move the consent agenda? Uh, 
I have a motion to move it. Motion to move it. Okay, hang on, hang on a second, Madam Clerk, go ahead. It will be the consent agenda minus item 3 that was pulled by Vice Mayor Paul. Correct. And also the minutes with the corrections? Yes. Yes. Uh, is there a motion subject to those changes? Yes. Okay, um, is there a second? I had a question. Where's the legislative priority? I forgot. I think, I believe it's page 91 of the agenda packet. No, but is that's not in the consent agenda, is it? No. Okay, good. Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, anybody have any discussion on that? I need um, a second, Mayor. Uh, well, I think, oh, I thought Smallsauer had her hand up seconding it. Okay, Nelly, go ahead. Said uh, he would make the motion and I seconded it. Very good. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Okay, call the question, please. Commissioner Salsauer? Yes. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Bouquet? Yes. Mayor, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, 4A, second reading for ordinances. Sandra, would you please take us through that? Ordinance A1. Yes, Mayor. An ordinance of the Town Commission of the Town of Surfside, Florida amended the Town of Surfside Code of Ordinances by amending Section 90-41 regulated uses to change the list of permitted accessory uses to allow pet grooming as accessory to retail pet supplies in the SDB 40 zoning district and providing for related regulations, providing for several severability providing for inclusion in the code, providing for conflict, and providing for an effective date. That's item 4A1. Good, thank you. Is there a motion to move that? Motion to approve. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Okay. Eliana seconds it. Any discussion? Oh, I'd like to have discussion. Just I don't need three minutes. Charles, go ahead. Um, related to this being a, you know, a pet business in the business district, um, this is great, you know, and that we're filling vacancies and that we're having a diverse, um, I see growing business district. Um, but with pets, there are unique issues that we have to um, really consider. And there are laws and ordinances that are on the books that are going to kick in if we see increased uh, waste, nuisance, threats from animals. Um, the prior commission, um, I think rightfully opened the door to the vet service. Um, that's, that business does have an entrance off of the parking lot um, behind the, the businesses towards Abbott and, um, and therefore might see a little bit less pet traffic off of Harding. Um, but given that we have litter types of issues already on Harding, um, just a word to the new owner um, that you have to adhere and your, your clients are going to need to adhere to the other laws on the books. There's nothing tied to this ordinance related to that, but they will be enforced, whether it's dogs in a grocery store or a restaurant around food um, and, um, and risks to passersby from bites um, and just um, excrement and pee. Um, you know, I'm all for pets and I happen to love dogs and happen to be allergic, allergic to cats, although I love cats too. Um, but. That's what I have to say because I could see a potential issue unless that's really, really taken into consideration. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Tina. Uh, thank you. Yes, I just would like to respond to Commissioner Kessel's concerns. I mean, I share those concerns. Um, it is written in here, uh, no malodorous shall be perceptible uh, at the boundary of the premises. And, and I can defer to the attorney. I do believe that all the town codes and ordinances do apply as far as um, litter and things like that, uh, compliance in the business district. So I believe they're held to the same same standards as any other business, if not higher. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor, before, Mayor. I, if I may, I'm sorry. Um, Sandra, can you just confirm uh, for the record that this ordinance was before the Planning and Zoning Board as the local planning agency? and that they did recommend approval of this ordinance. That's correct. On the date of that hearing. That's correct, Madam Attorney. Also, Mayor, this is a public hearing, so we should open it to the public. Okay, let's do it. And I do not have currently any public speakers wishing to speak on this item. Okay. If anyone wishes to speak, please raise your hand. 
There's no one, Mayor. Okay, thank you. We'll close the public section then session and then go ahead and call the question, please. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Nellie. What what Sandra was just mentioning, do did we have to publicize this in our uh, website and stuff like that so people could make comments on changing the ordinance? Have we done that? It was actually even advertised in the Miami Herald. Okay. Um, just wanted to... It changes so, so good. Well, section of okay. the code 90. Okay, so residents had ample time to come in and make their comments and, and nobody yes. did. Oh, perfect. That's all I needed to know. Very good. Call the question, please. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Commissioner Salasauer? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Briquette? Yes. Mayor the motion carry. Thank you. Okay, the next item is uh, B5, resolution and proclamations. Would you please read 5A, please, Sandra? Yes, uh, Mayor, just to confirm, Lily, should we take, I mean, they have the choice to take them all together or should we go one by one? As well, actually, maybe we'll stop now because it's 8.15 and we'll have good and welfare and then we'll continue. So that's a good place to stop because it's a nice round, round number. Okay, let's open up good and welfare. Is there anybody who would like to speak this evening? And a quick question, Mr. Mayor, are we going to reserve our comments to the three minutes to the end? Yes. I, well, listen, I'm a little confused because I know we had, uh, we, we, we were going to try one and then we were going to try another. And I think we were going to decide which uh, we liked better. But uh, let's just leave it to the end right now and we'll see how that works. Go ahead. First speaker, please. First keep. Speaker is Jeff Rose. Jeff, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Good evening, everybody. Jeff Rose, 8851 Fraud Avenue. I didn't really want to be first, but okay. Um, I just want to say thank you guys for having Senator Pizzo on. I thought that was very informative on a lot of local issues, the undergrounding, uh, as well as a few other things. And also, hopefully, we'll be able to get back to uh, some more local things like the new park. I know that's while we're down on the agenda, it seems like we're moving pretty smoother tonight. Um, the walkability, I know that's something on the agenda, but hopefully, you know, we don't have too many meetings left uh, this year. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone through half of our, me our meetings, really. Um, you know, the term's halfway over. Only, after this, we only got pretty much 12 meetings, commission meetings left. So, you know, there's a lot of local things we need to work on. The walkability, the undergrounding, if, what we're going to do with that. Um, the downtown district, how, how we can improve that, whether we're going to paint the sidewalks or potentially expand it. There's a lot of local things that I know I know that you guys want to work on and a lot of residents want to see done. So I hope, you know, we're going to be able to knock off a lot of these local local issues for the residents. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Joshua Epstein, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Joshua Epstein, 9317 Bay Drive. I'm going to be very brief with my comments, but something I want to emphasize again is I don't appreciate the alternate reality that comes out in the Gazette especially because of the fact that it is town resources and residents are being purposely misled as to what goes on at commission meetings. So they're living, residents are only hearing an alternate reality because they don't have time to come to the meetings. So we owe it to them to maintain truth in government, which is an item coming up now that I'll talk on, so I'll, I'll remain brief. But I think that that's something that's non-negotiable. You have to be honest with our residents. And you keep on saying you're going to produce clips of when this it was approved unanimously. It's never happened. There's no uh, clips for me to produce because I would have to produce an entire meeting because it's like two hours of discussion. So there's no clip I can produce. But if you, I, I encourage you, keep on saying you're going to produce clips of when it happened unanimously for the zoning code, when everything happened, where these complaints were that you received on the Jeff Road sign, except for, for the Jeff Road sign, signs, except for that anonymous complaint, complaint that came in the day after. All the stuff that you say at the meetings, like it's fact that I'd like to actually see proof. And I know you have a lot of time on your hands, so time should not be an issue. Another thing I wanted to bring up was something I wanted to bring up for a while regarding our town employees. And I know in specific departments, I'd really like, and I think residents would also, if we can look into taking all of our part-time employees in departments or make like adding more full-time employees to the staff, because we seem to be running the town like a business where we're trying to scam our employees out of healthcare and out of the benefits that they get from working 40 hours a week, or whatever it is full-time. So let's stop having our employees work 37 hours a week or 
like a couple hours under whatever that threshold is so that they can get that health insurance for their family or for themselves. And also, if we're not going to do that, then we should at least, because we're going to, in 2026, we're going to have to anyways. So we should look into making the minimum wage for our account employees $15 so that all of our cleaning people who live on their own, who this is their only job, can earn $15 an hour. That's something that's not going to cost the town a lot of money. And that's something that we can do. That's going to be mandatory by law in 2026, but we shouldn't have to be forced by the state to pay our employees a livable wage. We, that's something that we should do now. That's not going to cost a lot. And it's a very nice gesture to our town employees, especially how hard they work throughout the pandemic with no extra money that they've gotten. And they've been working at under $15 an hour, which in Miami did is not a livable wage whatsoever. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Uh, next speaker, please. I do not have any other speakers, Mayor. Okay, then we'll go back to the agenda. Would you please take us through 5A, Sandra? Yes, Mayor. I thought we get to talk, three minutes. Well, we do. Do you want, yeah, go ahead. I didn't see the um, tangle up. Do you want to respond to something? Yeah, yeah, I just, I think that, you know, listen, like I said, my son brings, does his own research into his own things that he wants to talk about, but I do think the idea of paying our employees, you know, the $15, I think would be, is something that's important. I, I, I have for years not been happy with the fact that we have a lot of um, part-time staff that don't get quite enough hours in order to get the benefits. It's not, it's not nice. I mean, I know, you know, we're, we are a community that, that can afford to pay people decently and give them, you know, healthcare so that they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff and have three or four jobs. You know, the difference to have an employee who's working just under the 40 hours so that we can, save the money on having to provide them with health care. It's just not not nice. So I don't know how many employees we have like that. I know that, you know, in, in for me, I see lifeguards. I think there's a lot of part time, that kind of stuff. I would, in general, like us to be able to move to an employee based system, uh, not part time, full time, you know, just like we did with the in house, uh, you know, PR person, that idea of having employees that are loyal to the town. I think if we have if we give a little, we'll get a lot back. In, in effort and loyalty, et cetera. So that's just my thoughts. I didn't I didn't know he was gonna talk about that tonight, but I do agree, so thanks. Anybody else, Tina? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not aware of us doing that with part-time employees, so I, I'm, but I do think that um, we did have a study that was happening that this commission actually halted. It was almost completed. It was, uh, forgive me, I'm not remembering the name of the study, but it was recommended by our uh, HR director. And, uh, you know, it was to, uh, it was a compensation study to, to be sure that we're paying people the right amounts. And I think because of COVID, I supported the cancellation of it at the time, but I think we should really look at that again because um, that's how you really get the, when hiring, that's how you get the best employees is because you're offering them a good deal. And, and so we lose a lot of candidates by not doing that. So um, if if we could, if someone can help me out, uh, either Yami or the manager, uh, the name of that study, if we could bring that back, I think we should. Okay, Nelly. Uh, yes, um, in terms of that study, um, I think we also have to look at the amount of work that is being done in Surfside versus the cities that we're looking at to do a comparison. Um, also, I don't. I, I think the reason, if there is any part-time employees, is because there isn't enough work to have a full-time employee. So, if you have this full-time, this part-time employee, is because that's the amount of work that really needs to be covered. So, you want to hire this person on a full-time basis when there isn't enough work to give that person a full-time basis. Um, and then there could be also reasons that that person has different jobs and he prefers to be on a part-time thing. Um, so I think those things need to be analyzed first. They need to be, these questions need to be asked before we're making any kind of motion to make part-time employees, uh, full-time employees, and actually ask the directors of each department that has these employees because they're the best person to ask and the best person that has the account, the knowledge to know whether they need a full-time employee or they need a part-time employee. Um, so I think that that's where that needs to start. Um, in terms of that study also, I'd like to know how much it was 
because I believe it was something like 60,000 or something like that. I remember it was a huge amount of money and that's why we canceled it. Um, so we're, we're, we're okay to spend, and I, I don't know for sure if it was 60,000, but it's crazy that if it is, that we would be spending $60,000 on a study to find out whether we're paying our, our employees properly or not versus getting money to um, fix our zoning code, which is for our residents. So just that, I, like I said, I don't know the exact number, but if I, I do recall it was somewhere within that high number. Okay, Charles. A minute left, so I'll use it. Oh, you, you reserve your minute? Okay. Um, just real quickly, I, um, I want to thank um, the speakers for being very brief and to the point, um, not just tonight, but in the, in the recent meetings. Um, I thought there have been very constructive comments and not everybody's using up all their, their three minutes so we can keep moving forward. Um, regarding anything related to organizational planning of uh, full-time and part-time personnel, um, that's a deliberate thing done through the manager with the directors of each department. And it's hard to comment on one position at a time. Um, as it is now, we have our great budget committee that's going to work with the town and the directors to, um, to put the best org chart together to, uh, to right size as appropriate for the next fiscal year. And I look forward to see what they come up with. Thanks. Uh, I would just say with respect to the study, I think, uh, and I think Tina is going to tell us how much it was, but I think, uh, you know, the first question I'd have is when did we do the last study before this study? And I think the manager probably has a very good idea of what pay rate should be if we don't have, uh, if we don't have a, a current study within the last few years, well, then that's a different story. Maybe if he need, if he feels he needs that, then I think that uh, he should be the one to bring that forward rather than the commission telling the manager how he needs to run his uh, employees. I know that the employees are talking about forming a union and I think that uh, if that is gonna go through, that will sort of change the, the dynamic. Um, but in any event, I think that uh, we ought to first find out from Tina how much, if Tina, do you happen to know how much it was? Um, yes, thank you. I, I wanted to respond to that because it, it is let's, called the pay. Stop. Wait, 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 I didn't call on you to talk. I just called oh. you to respond to that because I'm in my time. Can you, do you happen to know what it is, what it costs? Yeah, I didn't finish my time, but I, uh, I can tell you it was around uh, 10,000 or 15,000. It wasn't more than that. So, um, you know, my point is, is that, you know, basically I think that's the manager should come to us and suggest that after he looks at what the facts are. Um, I think it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice thought, but uh, again, um, I don't think that, uh, I think our employees have been treated very well, especially during COVID because I think they've all been paid throughout. I don't think anybody, I think there were a few people that were laid off in the community center. Were they laid off or were they, were they, did they, were they continue to be paid? As far as I know, they were laid off. Okay. Um, I, well, Tim, are you on uh, the call? Yeah. No. Tim, I Yami see. might be able to answer that or, or Jason. I, I see. Okay, Yami, Jason, Tim, I mean, did we did we lay a people off for COVID? Yes, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Yes, we did. We actually uh, let go of 25 uh, Parks and Rec part-time staff for a period of approximately two months uh, from March to May or uh, something like that. But it was about 24 employees that we actually let go and we rehire them as we were opening the facilities in Parks and Rec. Are they all rehired now? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Tina, go ahead. You can finish your comments. Okay, well, I just wanted to say it's called the pay and classification study. And it was, uh, I think the last one, yeah, actually, Yami could answer it better, but I think the last one was done like maybe more than five years ago. And so we were doing this and then COVID hit and the study was mostly completed. So I, I do think, you know, uh, Yami could explain it better than me, but to be fair, it, it's a good idea to have that in order to recruit the best possible people. Well, that's a horse of a different color. I mean, had we already paid for it? I mean, if it was underway, had we paid for a part of it, Yami? Yes, sir, uh, we did. Uh, the actual study was about $18,000 uh, for a pay and classification study that we're gonna look at uh, 
uh, at our market in the area and compare not just uh, salary, but also benefits. It was a full blown study. We were updating job descriptions at that time. Employees filled out questionnaires to uh, upgrade our, our, do, our uh, job descriptions to the, to the duties that we perform to, in today's day. The last time that we did it was in 2012. We uh, requested a review uh, of that plan in 2015. So we, we did review it in 15, but it wasn't done as a complete uh, report. It was just an upgrade on the actual pay scale. Okay, so Best practice, I'm sorry. Where are, we, where are we as far as the report goes? And uh, how much have we invested so far in that report? We've paid about a fourth uh, of the cost. Uh, how much is that? It was $18,000 uh, for the full study. That fourth have paid. I'm sorry? How much is that fourth that you mentioned that we have paid? Yeah, it, it was paid about $4,000, $5,000 is probably what we paid. Uh, 4000 it was 18000 18, for the full study. We were in the face of updating uh, job descriptions at that time, uh, and, and then we were asked to, to stop the study. Okay, well, that's enough. Thank you very, very much for that. Anybody else comments on that? We'll go to, we got one more speaker I want to get. Go ahead, Nelly. Yes, um, I honestly think that this should be Andy's discretion, as he is the town manager, and in our charter it says that he's the person responsible for um, hiring and firing, and honestly, I don't think that this is something that we should take away from our town manager. And I don't think that if, I mean, how many um, uh, studies do we need to do? I mean, is there a requirement by the state that we need to do this every uh, so often? Um, or is there a requirement by the county? I'd like to know that because why do we need, if we did a study five years ago, why do we need another study right now? Um, I, I don't see the, the reason for spending $18,000 of our residents' money on a study that, that was done only five years ago. Um, sorry. Thank, thank you very much. Bring in that last speaker who hasn't spoken yet, uh, Sandra. Yes, Mayor. Now we have Horace Henderson. Horace, please state your name and address for the record in your comments. Good evening, Horace Henderson, 9195 Collins Ave. Um, I believe that there are 30 emails to be read in uh, support of the planning and zoning code. And I would like to voice my support for that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there 30 um, people that have written in, Sandra? No, Mayor, we have not received any emails today. Just one that was forwarded to the commission after Senator Piso spoke today. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on with the agenda then. Um, we're up to 5A, legislative priorities. Could you please take us through that? Yes, Mayor. A resolution of the Mayor and the Town Commission of the Town of Surfside, Florida, approving a state legislative priorities for 2021. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yes. Authorizing the Town Manager and Town Officials to implement the legislative priorities and providing for an effective date and 5A. Wait, is there a motion to move that forward? Motion to approve. Okay. I want, I'd like to discuss it because I you know, wanted to. You know what, Commissioner? Thank you. you have to listen to the meeting and not just blurt out your comments. I asked for a second. I didn't ask for your blurting out. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. All right, thank you. Now discussion. Who'd like to discuss? Okay, Commissioner. Okay. Sorry. Um, I, what I was saying earlier with um, when the Senator Pizzo was on, um, I was thinking we have sort of one items one to 12 here. And I think that number, I mean, we have to decide as a commission what our priorities are. And I think that number 12 should be number, should be number one um, because home rule, uh, that's a fancy term for us being able to decide what happens in Surfside for Surfside residents getting to decide what happens in Surfside. And so I feel like that is sort of the top priority because unless we have you know, um, a say in what happens in our own town, that then, you know, I, there's no point. You know, if the, if the government preempts us on everything and we're wasting our time doing anything. So that was my first thing. And then the other thing that I thought was really important that I wanted to see added back, because we have a copy in here on page 373 of the legislative priorities from 2019, 2020. And the top thing on there is uh, land acquisition support for parks and open spaces. 
additional support for creation of bike and walking paths. So I, that's an item that did not make it into the 2020, 2021. Um, for some reason, they put creation of back, you know, they, they added that to the transportation funding for traffic calming and mitigation. Um, it doesn't matter where that goes with the creation of bike walking paths, that's already on there. But I do think we wanna have land acquisition support parks and open spaces on there because that's something that we've all expressed an interest in doing or at least three of the commissioners have so okay very good charles um i agree with that uh when i talked to the town manager about this i said hey are these a numerical priority or are, can these just be bullet points and he said oh they can just be bullet points i think that's the confusion in terms of having number one we're all gonna we could debate all night about what should be number one and then the order from there so i just propose we put these into bullet points and we add what commissioner salzauer suggested that is very important to keep on it and then move forward. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Um, Andy, you had your hand up first. <laughs> Sorry, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I, I, this conversation started with the Vice Mayor and I, I wanna give her uh, a, a shout out and thank her for, for, for kind of helping guide me. I reached out to Senator um, Pizzo and, and our lobbyist and I've kind of engaged them a little bit already. So just to let you know that, and yes, uh, I, to, to uh, Commissioner Kessel's uh, uh, comments, yeah, these we just put them out on paper, and we didn't we didn't pro we did not prioritize, and that was for you. Okay, uh, Tina. Yes, and, and, um, thank you, thank you, um, Town Manager, and I just wanted to uh, agree with uh, Commissioner Kessel that uh, bullet points is fine. Um, you know, I, I assisted um, the town manager with this list. Uh, it was not in any particular order. It was just kind of um, looking at what our pre past priorities were that weren't fulfilled and adding new ones. So, um, you know, it's really a, wor a working document to, to submit to try to get funding. Um, I really feel the infrastructure is key. Um, that's something that needs to be done, the uh, water main on Collins Avenue. So I'm um, home rule definitely. I'm all for that being number one, and uh, the transportation maybe number two, and the inf well infrastructure is number two. I mean that's really important. And and Senator Pizzo stated that that's where the funding is right now. So we're likely to get that. Um, so yeah, I mean all these are important. So you know bullet points is fine. Thank you, Nelly. I also agree with um, Charles's um, comment about the bullet points. I think that's a very good solution. And this way you're not having a one, two, three or putting them in different positions versus um, as you mentioned, uh, Tina, that they are all important. So I think, I think the bullet point um, suggestion to me is the best option in this term instead of um, numbering them. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Charles. I just, that was I a just, great I wanted to make the commission aware that uh, I had reached out to the owner of the uh, property on 88th Street, the large, beautiful lot that we've all been dreaming about for a park on the south end of our uh, beautiful town. And uh, I, I, I suggested that we could uh, work any number of deals out, including have the uh, park donated and have the park named after the person that donated it. Um, unfortunately, I was uh, told that it is in a uh, corporate name and that uh, I was lectured about, I was not lectured, I think I was schooled about how corporations are there for the benefit of the stockholders and donating property wouldn't be uh, advantageous to the uh, stockholders. So I was disappointed to get that lesson in capitalism. Uh, but, uh, and I was also, uh, I was disappointed to hear because I've been expecting a, a downturn at any point. It seems like our stock market gets crazier and crazier every day. I'm, I'm waiting for it to fall off a cliff. And then all of a sudden there'll be some great bargains around and the city could go shopping and uh, get some real good value for its money. Um, I, I was led to believe, however, that the, uh, the, the properties that we had been sort of dreaming about for uh, extending our parks and placing our parks in were both sold now um, and, and sold for really crazy numbers too. And uh, I, I think that that was disappointed to hear that, but listen, I, 
as a real estate guy myself, I would say that, you know what? Times change and circumstances change and, and the guy that bought it for the crazy number may be back in the market to just uh, get rid of it if he needs to and we'll be here to help him do that should that occasion arise. Um, I do like I do like all of these priorities. I'm excited that uh, you know uh, Senator Pizzo was uh, was uh, helpful on the uh, sea level rise and the sustainability and the resiliency issue, especially with respect to raising homes. So um, that's something I think that will go a long way towards uh, solving the problem that our residents have complained about for years and years and years that they don't feel like anything's getting done. And I just want to add for everybody that's listening um, uh, about the flooding issue. You know, we're going to be talking about the uh, the engineers now, and I think we're going to hire a whole bunch of engineers, and we're going to have an opportunity to have those engineers sort of opine on recommendations that were made uh, many years ago, and uh, that's going to cost a significant amount of money. And I know that there are stakeholders. Um, who are involved that I've invited to this meeting to talk about that particular issue because, uh, you know, we always want to focus our resources as directly as possible and get the biggest bang for the buck um, and get as many people on board with the idea to move forward that we able to ultimately sort of come up with. So with that, I will sort of uh, leave it there. And I think that we will... Uh, we will uh, either go around again for another three minutes or we will call the question. Commission, what's your preference? Do you want to go around for another three minutes? I didn't use my three minutes, so okay. I... You did. No, you I spoke. didn't actually. You spoke. I got you checked. You spoke. I didn't Wait. do three, my three minutes. I reserved you're, my time. You're, you spoke. You're done. Okay. Unless everybody wants to go around another three minutes. We're working on the priorities for the town. But do you want to argue about that, Commission? We have a policy no. and I you and I are constantly creating a problem. I did not use the three minutes, so I had another yeah, constant. People didn't use you brought their, up the whole the legislative the list talking. and you mentioned about the prioritizing. Nelly, of Nelly, we're, listen, I'm running the meeting. We're going to try to do it with decorum and we're going to try to do it with a process. The process was we go around for three minutes and when people are done, if someone wants to reserve their time, they've said they want to reserve their time. Okay, so that's how we're going to do it. Madam Clerk, please call the question. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Commissioner Sassar? We didn't make the changes yet. We didn't add back the land acquisition. Okay, okay. you made that suggestion. And everyone said yes, they like okay. that. All right, well, that's that's part of it then. Okay. But we have to add, we have to specifically tell Commissioner. her to add it. Commissioner. We have to add it to the agenda or it doesn't Wait, go in. a second. Uh, listen, Mr. Manager, Madam Clerk, was it added? It's not part of the motion. Okay, madam. Okay, motion maker. Who's the motion maker? Tina. Mayor Paul. Tina. Yeah, yeah. Now, are you okay with adding that? Yes, I am. Actually, um, that just reminded me that I also wanted to add to number six to oppose oil drilling in Big Cypress National Preserve. And that wasn't added either. So okay. that's good. All right. Well, who's the seconder? I'm the seconder. And I'll propose to the vice mayor, who's the firster. That um, that we just say oil drilling period on public lands because we don't know there could be oil drilling planned for in the Everglades or offshore, et cetera. Make it general. Well, this is very specific. It's happening. It's I mean they they've given the permits. Well, there and and other public lands. Okay. Very good. Okay. And so one more the the resort tourist tax protection. All right, hey, Commissioner. Listen, you already talked and now you're extending. Okay. The bottom line is, is we revise the vote based upon what you said earlier in your talk. Are you voting for it or against it? Go ahead and unmute your mic, please. The resort and tourist tax protection didn't make it on there either this year. Okay. First of I'd all, like the motion maker to add that. Okay. Motion maker, do you, will you add that? Yes, thank you for pointing that out. All right. Yeah, thank you. Charles, will you second that? All right, thank you. Madam Clerk, yes. call the question again. Mayor, just to confirm, we have added land acquisition, oil drilling in public land, and resort tax protections to the uh, motion. Correct. Commissioner Asquist? Well, well the, the oil drilling is um, opposing oil drilling in Big Cypress National Preserve and public uh, lands. 
And public lands, yes. All public lands, yeah. Uh, uh, Mayor, if I may, is it the will of the commission to also change this to bullet points as was discussed instead of numbers? Yes. yes. You might want to add that, Vice Mayor, as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, so we've got bullet points. We've got oil in the ever what is it, Everglades? Was it was uh, Big, Big Cypress Cypress National uh, Cypress Cypress and public lands generally? We've got bullet points and we've got tourist tax. Correct. Anything else? And land acquisition. Land acquisition. Okay, good. Continue with the roll call, please. Commissioner Velasquez. Uh, well, yes. Gotta get, you got to get Salzauer because she didn't vote. Oh, Commissioner Salzauer? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Riquette? Yes. Mayor Le Motion carries. All right, very good. Okay, next subject is item 5B, uh, continuing engineering services. Okay. Yes, There's eight different resolutions for the same, um, I'm not sure if you want to lump them on all or yeah. Yeah. Sandra, if I, if I may, um, you can read items 5B, one through eight. I'm sorry, read the titles into the record and then they can be approved by one motion unless somebody has wants to pull it and discuss it separately, but you can do it that way. Okay, well, let's find out right now if someone wants to pull one of these and discuss it. Okay, then go ahead, Sandra, and read it. So I'll be reading eight titles, Mayor, so bear. And I'll go get a glass of water while you're doing that. <laughs> okay. Item 5B, one, it's KC, Technolo KC Ag Technologies, a resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing services agreement with KCI Technologies Inc. for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing service agreement, authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuing services agreement and provide it for an effective date. Next is 5B2, the Corradino Group, a resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing service agreement with Corradino Group Inc for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing service agreement, authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuing service agreement and provide for an effective date. Next will be five, item five, two, three, chief and associates, a resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing services agreement with Keith and associates in for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing services agreement, authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuing service agreement and provide it for an effective date. Next item will be 5B4, Kimberly Horn Associates. The resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing service agreement with Kimberly Horn and Associates, Inc for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing service agreement, authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuing service agreement and provide it for an effective date. Next one will be 5B5, CAP Government, a resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing service agreement with CAP, CAP Government Inc. for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing service agreement authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all action necessary to implement the continuing service agreement and provide it for an effective date. Next item will be 5B6, Alvarez Engineers. A resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing service agreement with Alvarez Engineering Inc. for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing service agreement, authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuing services agreement and providing for an effective day. Item 5B7, Nova Consulting, a resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing service agreement with Nova Consulting Inc. for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuing service agreement and authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuing service agreement and providing for an effective date. Item 5B8, 300 Engineer Group. A resolution of the mayor and the town commission of the town of Surfside, Florida, approving the continuing service agreement with 300 Engineer Group PA 
for professional engineering services, authorizing the town manager to execute the continuous service agreement and authorizing the town manager and town officials to take all actions necessary to implement the continuous service agreement and provide it for an effective date. Thank you, town attorney. Good job, Sandra. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to move those items? Motion to approve. Is there a Thanks. second? Nelly, okay. Anybody want to discuss it? Okay, I don't hear anybody wanting to discuss it. Uh, call the question then, Sandra. Commissioner Salazar? Mm -hmm. She's muted. She's busy. Keep. Commissioner Crespo? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. I need to go back to Commissioner Salazar. Yes, okay. She's nodding yes, but she's unable to unmute herself. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Briquette? Yes. Mayor, the motion carries. All right, very good. Um, can you read the uh, next one, which includes uh, the item from the consent agenda, I item E? So, so I guess we'll read them separately. Is that what you were looking for, Tina? Um, I, I, I just wanted to link them because they involve the same thing. So, um, all right. Well, well, since it's the manager's item, uh, E, Mr. Manager, do you have a preference on how we take this item? No, not at all. You can, um, might want to do 5C and then the budget amendment to follow. Okay, very good. Uh, Sandra, would you please take us through 5C? Yes, Mayor. A resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of Surfside, Florida, approving an agreement with Keith and Associates, Inc. for engineering professional services for the Abbott Avenue drainage improvements project from 90th Street to 96th Street, providing for authorization and implementation, authorizing the expenditure of funds, <laughs> and providing for an effective date as item 5C. Is there a motion to move that? Nelly, is there a second? I'll second. Charles, thank you. Discussion, who would like to go first, Nelly? Um, I just um, I just wanted to know, in terms of um, the $9,000 that are in here for them to look at the CGA, I, I, I thought that what they were doing was um, giving us a whole new set of suggestions. So my thing is, I don't understand why they have to look at what somebody else did and the reason why we didn't go with their um, suggestions is because uh, we we wanted to get other opinions. So why do they have to look at something that we already uh, denied and spend $9,000 for them to look at it when they should be giving us other options? Okay, does somebody want to uh, respond to that? Vice Mayor has a comment, go ahead. Oh, I, um, I actually not to respond to that, but uh, you know, I just wanted to comment on. Um, Go ahead. You know, I think that the reason. Uh, okay, I, on the previous commission, we did the Abbott study two years ago, tw 2018, toward the end of the year, and um, we had gotten the recommendation of the three options, and the previous commission didn't want to move forward on this. We instead had um, Abbott drainage as a legislative priority, and I believe we did get some funding for drainage this year, which is why I didn't add it to the legislative priority list this, you know, this year because we did get funding. Um, my concern is that um, I believe this commission wanted to have another company look at it to get a second opinion, and this is like a seventy-three thousand dollar second opinion, and I'm not really comfortable with that. Um, I'm comfortable to work with, uh, you know, Keith Engineering. Um, my concern is that, you know, we were also, uh, when, when we had approved this on the previous commission, um, after we'd approved this, we were uh, then given that we need to uh, do a new stormwater master plan. And so we did allocate $200,000 for that in, the in last year's budget. And uh, that was halted. But when this commission took office, that was halted. Um, the stormwater master plan is really important for uh, people's insurance. It's uh, important for our public works. And I'm just curious, how does, how does that work with this project? I feel that that's more important to move forward with because that will 
maybe answer some of the questions that we're looking to be answered on, on this request. And um, I, I believe that CGA did tasks one and two. So um, I have a problem with those and I don't know how you get to task three, which hasn't been done, I'm all for that, but how do you get there and skip one and two? Because I don't see why we need to do that. We, you know, we didn't even need to do the study two years ago to know there's a problem there, but we're trying to solve the problem. So uh, I think if, if, and I'd like to know um, maybe from, from the engineering firm that um, if, would the stormwater master plan address these issues on Abbott and provide solutions to these issues? So that's really my question there. Um, also, uh, if you read through this resolution and, and the um, work plan, uh, sorry, it's on page, oh. mm -hmm. um, so 3.14 is, am I out of time? Three, on page 314, there's um, things that the town needs to submit to the consultant. We don't have a budget for this at the moment. We haven't uh, figured that out. So it, it asked for um, um, B number nine at the bottom of page 314, it asked for current town's budget documents and available budget for the implementation of recommendation, recommended improvements. So first of all, we don't know what they are and we don't have a budget for that. Thank you, Commissioner, Vice Mayor, I beg your pardon. Um, go ahead, Charles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Vice Mayor uh, Paul. That, that was a very good point, especially at the end. Uh, part of why we're doing this study is to determine what the budget will be. That said, uh, we did give the town staff direction to solve Abbott Avenue drainage. Um, at the same time, the town has the direction to um, do the master stormwater, stormwater master plan. Um, and, um, and we're the ones that actually made that made those two separate uh, because of the urgency of the Abbott issue. Um, to me, um, $70,000 to, um, to both um, look at the CGA study um, and, and with the second pair of eyes, um, you know, and I'm not an engineer. Um, I trust the town um, leaders in the management department, including Jason and Andy, um, that, um, you know, and their experience of knowing what is uh, proper for engineering services. Um, I agree with you, um, Vice Mayor, that you know it does seem a little bit strange to have to spend $9,000 to uh, to call the information, and Commissioner Velasquez, as you said too, to call the information from CGA, which <clears throat> I wouldn't use the word reject. Um, I would say that, that we have yet not validated or looked at the, um, at the, at the, at the um, how appropriate or, um, or or wise their recommendations were and their studies. So to me, that seems uh, pretty reasonable. Um, I mean, $73,000 is a drop in the bucket compared to damage that flooding will do on Abbott. Um, and um, it, it is linked intrinsically to the master plan for stormwater, um, storm, stormwater runoff. And, um, and this is um, you know, a good trial period to get our new engineering contractors um, feet wet. Um, bad pun with flooding, right? Um, feet wet in, um, in the realm of getting to know our drainage system. Um, I'm not discounting the CGA data that they work for or questioning the reputability of their engineering studies. Um, in the past, I've questioned the need for so many at different times and just the fact that it's only one firm and not getting different second opinions, third opinions. So um, I'm ready to, to, to move forward with this, with this proposal. Okay, thank you, Charles. Eliana? Um, all right, I, I, I'm having technical issues. So my laptop overheated. I had to dial back in from my iPad. So sorry about being off and on. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with a lot of things that the vice mayor is saying. Um, I missed a little a part of it, but th there is a flooding, obviously there's a flooding problem on Abbott. There's flooding issues all over town as well. And I do think that the stormwater master plan is is very important for the whole town because water, you know, it's not you can't just treat one area in isolation of the others. Um, so I do think we need a comprehensive plan in dealing with the water. But I also do think that Abbott is an area that requires you know more immediate attention because they consistently flood all the time. But as we're seeing, that problem is spreading as well to the rest of the town. So. 
you know, I, I remember when, when Calvin Giordano came back, I was at all those meetings where they had their solutions and it was, none of them were ideal and they were very, very expensive and none of them were going to solve the problem, which is why it was so frustrating. Um, and which is why we decided to bring in outside consultants and outside engineers to take a look at this. And so I do think it's important that we come up with a solution um, and we do have to spend money on that, but I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not familiar enough with what this engineering work costs. That does seem like a whole lot of money to review somebody else's study. It doesn't, I don't understand why that's how expensive it is. But again, that's not, it's not an area that I work in. So maybe Jason can explain that. Um, but I do think we do need to spend money to address the flooding issue because all of these other solutions that we're coming up with, you know, whether it's, you know, raising the houses or putting the houses on pontoons or whatever we're doing, um, having camels drink the water. We, we do need solutions quickly for the people on Abbott. Um, so I don't know where that, what's the fastest way is really what I want to know. What's the fastest way to get the relief to residents from the flooding issue? Because, you know, someone else pointed out, we only have another year left. We only have 12 more meetings. And I feel like we haven't accomplished a lot of what we had set out to do. So I would like to speed up whatever we can do to kind of at least have made a difference with the time that we've spent. Okay. So thank you. Um, By 45 seconds for later, if you want to stop the clock there at 45 seconds, Jose, um, for afterwards. Thanks. I didn't finish using all my time either. Well, okay. Um, I'll, I'll go and then uh, we'll go back around again because it sounds like everybody wants to talk. Um, you know, if you recall, the reason that this is happening is because there was concern um, that we weren't uh, getting all the information and we wanted to have the broadest sort of uh, uh, type of report on the subject that we could get. Um, these guys were hired. It was a it was a long process because the, you know Abbott Avenue, Byron Avenue, they've been waiting, mostly Abbott Avenue, and um, we agreed to do it. We did it. We've got these guys on board, um, and I think that you know it's going to come down. My vote is going to be I'm going to do what the residents want to do. Uh, I've put forward a uh, a plan that I think uh, addresses the problem more comprehensively because at the end of the day what's going on here is bigger pipes in the ground uh, require bigger pumps above the ground to work nowadays because the pipes where they're located are too low to really effectively get the water out of the low-lying areas so what happens is is we rely on the bigger pipes which really which not really which don't stop the flood waters initially from coming into homes See, what happens is we're talking about a solution that will move the water out more quickly than it's being moved out right now, but it will not stop the water from initially going into the homes. So instead of those flooded homes having to suffer with water in their homes for four hours, um, they now will have, uh, you know, two hours worth of suffering because it'll move the water out quickly or more quickly. Uh, the other solution is raising the houses. Quite frankly, um, uh, if you ask me for my house, um, do I want bigger pipes in front to uh, move the water out after it floods my home? No, I want my home up and out of the way. I don't want the water ever coming in. And that's the solution that I've put forward. But you know, having said that, I want the uh, residents on Abbott and Byron and all the other streets that are affected to either buy into that because if they want to go down the road of bigger pipes, digging up the road, uh, and then relying on the pumps. You know, the pumps, when they're running, is nice, but when the pumps don't run, and a lot of times they don't run at the worst possible time, um, we end up with the same problem. Um, lifting the houses up out of danger solves the whole problem. But again, I'm willing to vote for this if that's what the residents want. I know there are probably many residents that want to talk about this because I've been talking to them on the phone about it. So I'm looking forward to hearing what the residents have to say when we open it up to uh, speakers. Now, commissioners, is it your pleasure to go around again for another three minutes before we open it up? Oh, oh, oh. I didn't get full three okay. minutes there on the first time. All right, well, Nellie, 
go ahead and take a minute and then we'll we'll see if there is a motion to uh, do another three minutes, okay? Okay. I just, you know, my concern was just the $9,000. In terms of the water master plan, uh, we are, I think that was a, a plan, a, a, a study that was done years ago. They want to do a new one, which I, if I don't recall correctly, if I recall correctly, back in uh, I think it was March or April, when we denied the continuing of spending of this, the question was asked to CGA if this was something that was needed and if we had to do it, and their answer was no. We didn't have to do this for the county. We didn't have to do this for the state. It was just something that they wanted to do. And I'm pretty sure we know where all our pipes are at this point in life. I mean, uh, we've been around for a very long time. It's not like we, we've been here for a couple of months or year or something like that, that we don't know where these pipes are located. We do have a map that tells us where all our pipes are. And Randy is pretty knowledgeable on all this. So I don't see why we would go back and try to even... Uh, re reinitiate a master water plan that we've already said no to Thank and you. spend $200,000 for just knowing where the pipes are is, is not good. Thank you, Nelly. Um, is there a motion to go around again? Vice Mayor, do you want to make a motion to go around? Yeah, a motion to go around again. All right. Is there a second to that? I guess not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Commissioner Salzhauer seconds it. Call the roll, Madam Clerk, for another round. Commissioner Velasquez. Yes. Uh, how how much how much time is the second go around? Because let's, we let's have a go, lot of. Let's go two minutes. Okay. Commissioner Sasauer. Yes. Commissioner Castle. Microphone. I, yeah, I'm going to say no because I think we should hear the residents, and then we're all going to get to talk again anyhow. Vice Mayor Paul? Uh, I'll say yes, but yeah, uh, you know, I want to hear from the residents too as well. Mayor Burkett? I'll say no because I want to hear from the residents. Actually, I want to change my vote to no, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, okay let's hear from the residents. Let's hear Resident, from the residents. Get a chance to talk again. Okay, but then again, you're you're talking again, Commissioner, without raising your hand. We agreed, okay? What What is it that you need? Um, I, we can talk again after the residents. That's fine. As long as we have a chance to talk about it again. That's fine. We always have a chance to talk about it. Okay. Who's the first speaker, Madam Clerk? Mary, we only have one speaker so far. It's Joshua Epstein. Joshua, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Okay. Joshua Epstein, 917 Bay Drive. I don't have much to say on this. Obviously, I support whatever the experts have said, and I'm supportive of whatever you guys are saying right now. The one thing I would like to say is the bringing up of this raising of the houses again and again. It's just repetitive and insane. It's not It's not that raising one house, raising one house might be a legitimate idea, but raising a house with thousands of houses, it, we don't have the funds for that. And even if we did get funding, it would only subsidize, I think, like half of the cost or a quarter of the cost. And at that point, these people have to live somewhere for months, and especially in the middle of a pandemic and where people don't have $75,000, $50,000 on hand to just say, here, raise my house. I think it's not realistic because in order to even get the funding for that, I think we'd have to sacrifice that instead of the plumbing, which is the plumbing is an, is an, an issue for everyone. And I don't think it's realistic for people who bought a house in this town and are living with a couple thousand dollars in the bank or I don't know, $20,000, $50,000 in the bank even. It's not fair to say to them, you have to spend your entire savings to raise your house because the commission didn't want to improve the sewer, um, the, 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 the drainage. So I think just improve the drainage. I'm supportive of what you guys are doing now. And I think it just gets ridiculous and some crazy idea to bring it up again and again. And I just think it's it's dumb and it's not realistic to do on a large scale. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Debbie Simadavilla. Debbie, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Hi, good evening, everyone. Deborah Smadevilla, 9108 Abbott Avenue. Um, I'm sorry I, I missed some of your, your comments. I do look forward to hearing you second time around. I do apologize. Thank you for this. Um, as, I, as I listened to what I was able to hear, I do believe that it's unnecessary to review the Calvin Giordano, um, the task one, because I went through it today. $9,000, I think that, you know, whether we're happy or not with Calvin Giordano, uh, I, I'm pretty confident that they looked at the information. It may not be 
perfectly or Don, I know that when we were reviewing as I was part of that selection committee, there were a few contractors or, or companies that said that they could have done X, Y, and Z. Um, if you don't want to pay that, I, I, I understand that. I think $9,000 we could save on that. But I would ask them for sure to come up with their, their ideas. I think the objective of this effort was to hear this company's ideas to see what could be resolved. Now, I, I do believe and I do agree with, in fact, I heard uh, Pizzo today, Jason Pizzo, state that in 30 years, you know, we're going to have major issues. So looking ahead, as I do support sustainability and resiliency, I do support the raising of the houses. Am I going to do it right now, today? Uh, I don't know. I don't even know how it, what it looks like. But I do appreciate the mayor's effort um, in looking into that because for the long view, long solutions. I know that these contractors are gonna t tell us we need to raise roads. I heard it, I was part of that committee. They talked about it, almost everyone talked about it. You can't raise a road if you don't raise a house, guys. It's just the way the cookie crumbles. So while I do totally support looking at funding, I like what, what, what he said, looking at funding, learning more about that, because that, that may be the long-term solution. I do support looking at what this company, which is very, very uh, successful, they have a lot of experience, and I believe, I may be wrong, but I believe they will give us different options, you know, an immediate solution, short-term solution, medium-term solution, and long-term solution. So I really support going ahead and spending the money to look at what options, new ideas they can give us, and as far as where the problems are. Heck, I have a library of documentation, of photographs, videos, measurements. I would love to get together with them or send them my information because it would save us a lot of time and money. Um, so that's what I that's what I've seen. And I thank you all of you guys for reviewing this. Thank you so much. Uh, and I can say say that for the rest of the people on 91st Street, Abbott, and Byron. Thank you so much. Thank you, speaker, please. The next speaker is Diana Gonzalez. Diana, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Hello, Diana Gonzalez, 9325 Dickens Avenue. Um, good evening, guys. I really appreciate that you are talking about a priority issue that we have with flooding. And I think it's great. I the same that Debbie, I agree that one of the issues, even if cost, is gonna be a cost for us is raising the, the houses. I think I would like to think in some ideas and dream that there is something cheaper or something better. But I agree with Debbie, if, we, if you are going to decide to raise the streets and the houses, we don't raise the houses, I think it's gonna be worse. I am not an expert in that, in, the, in that issue. I'm completely ignorant in that issue. But for all the information that the mayor already gave us, and all the information that I was looking on the on Google, Dr. Google told me also, with all this experience, raising a house is, even if this is going to be a cost for the neighbors, and is is one of the most uh, positive ideas. And for sure, I would like to hear more about that topic. If you can give us more information, it will be great. But we already had that information. And just, I was looking actually for options. If we're going to have some possibilities to, to find companies that they are going to be giving us different prices or how, what are the options that we have? It's all that I want to say. Really, flooring is one of the priorities for this town. And with the, the, the environment problems that we have, I think every year is gonna be worse. The water is gonna be worse and hurricanes and everything. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And I hope that you consider that and give us that option. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Diana. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Jeff Rose. Jeff, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Jeff Rose, 8851 Frat Avenue. Um, I didn't really want to talk on this, but since I guess it got brought up again with the raising the houses, this is something um, I know we've talked about before. It's going to trigger the height because um, if you got a one-story house now and you wanted to raise it up, let's call it 10 feet. Yeah, in 
for instance, Mr. Mayor, you have an older home and there's a lot of older homes that are two stories. You should be allowed just to do the same thing. If somebody's gonna raise their house or build new, whatever it is for flooding reasons, we're really gonna have to look at the, the charter and the high limit. I'm not talking about just your regular old new, new, two, new two story construction home. I'm talking about the sustainable home or raising a home. I mean, these are the bigger topics that I think we've all talked about a little bit. Bell Harbor has done it. They put it, they took it to a vote. They raised it for flooding reasons. Miami Beach has done it. All the other coastal cities around us realize you have to be able to build a higher, more sustainable home. It's an uncomfortable conversation we're gonna have to have because if we're gonna go raising our homes or building a higher, more sustainable home, we know we're gonna we're gonna touch that 30 foot high limit. And if it's gonna be for a sustainable, more resistant flooding home, I think that's something that hopefully this commission and, and the residents of Surfside will understand and want to move forward with. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mayor, I don't have any new public speakers. I do have one that wants to speak again. Yeah. I I think that we'd have to get permission from the commission to let Debbie speak again. Is there anybody that would object to Debbie speaking again? Okay, well then let her speak. Debbie? Debbie, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Hi, very short. Uh, Debbie Simadevia, 9108 Abbott Avenue. Just really quick, you know, maybe we could m combine these efforts if we're gonna be paying these guys for different uh, term options. Um, maybe they can give us, uh, you know, some insight on how to marry, uh, you know, the raising of the houses eventually or, and or, you know, we could use their technical expertise, um, you, you know, if, if that's gonna be part, if, if they could, if we're gonna be paying so much, maybe they can give us some help with that, just as, you know, one of the options for long-term, I don't know, just an idea, just because they're experts. So that's it, thank you so much. I do, I support both, I support both totally. I hope thank I made Thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to close the public portion of the meeting and uh, open it up to the commissioners again. Who would like to go first? Charles. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to everyone who spoke, um, including the fact that we went from, I think, one public speaker then to about six or seven. So everybody lined up, they woke up. <clears throat> that was nice. Um, obviously, the Abbott Avenue study um, is, is, um, is linked to the bigger picture. Abbott was left behind, right? That's as I, how I see it. So this commission voted to do something about it. And, um, and it, it takes a study to, uh, to validate the other study to then move forward. Um, it is linked to the stormwater master plan. Um, whether or not we need to do it right now, um, honestly, I'm with, I'm with Commissioner Velasquez in terms of remembering that maybe the timing might not be super pressing right now, but that's in the eye of the beholder. This is all linked together. Um, we need a stormwater master plan to need to know where the stormwater is going now after the development that we've had over the last couple of years since we've done this study. Things change. Um, um, and, um, and it's up to the town management to guide us on, on the timing of that. That said, I'm grateful for the mayor talking about lifting the homes up. Um, you know, that's innovative. Also, something like looking to what Europe's doing. Um, in terms of um, you know modular homes that are modern and can withstand um, uh, hurricanes, we see those in Costa Rica, we see those in South America, um, but that's more tied to Florida Building Code and Miami Dade Code, which we are not in charge of. Um, if, as uh, as Jeff Rose spoke, the surrounding communities are making it possible to um, you know to build higher, um, that said, that's something that we can do too. But I'd like to see it as a comprehensive plan, um, lifting homes in our area, because we're in Florida on an island with the high water table, we don't have basements. And, um, and these homes, um, as long as our, our foundations are strong, or even if they're not, can be lifted. Um, and um, we don't see a lot of repurposing of properties and moving of properties in South Florida as you do in other parts of the country. But, um, but it's something that, that can be done. Um, but it, but any kind of lifting of or raising of the height limits for new construction should be tied to the overall grand plan of, uh, of, of uh, the master plan. So now that comes back up. So it is all tied together. Um, but I don't want to poo-poo creative ideas, um, which are exactly what we need. Um, we need to be bold. And, um, and I'm glad that everybody's embracing that. That said, 
you know, if we're bickering over the small stuff, it's going to be really hard to do to do the, the bigger stuff, or perhaps the bigger stuff is even easier because we can make bold decisions and then trust the town staff to um, to move forward to carry it out, which is what we should be doing with a lot of this stuff anyhow. Um, and thanks for listening. Charles, thank you. Next speaker, please. Tina. Uh, thank you. So I just I just want to mention about the stormwater master plan because um, for this for the Abbott drainage study that we have, first of all, how many people have actually read that study that was done in 2018? Has any of this commission read that study? I've read it. Uh, that's a question. Okay. And um, uh, CGA used the 2013 stormwater master plan uh, when doing that study. That's the last time we had a master plan done. Uh, it is my understanding that the master plan is needed for uh, people's insurance. It's needed because of public works, because it's a utility that we um, supply. And so it, it is important and it is, it's, enti it's integral, it's tied together. It's, it's to holistically look at the town for um, where, where our trouble spots are. So um, there's a few things here. Um, yeah, I don't support, um, trying to look for my pages. I don't support uh, paying to review a study that we already paid for. And if, if we're not willing to look at the options that were presented to us two years ago. Um, prices go up. So um, the previous commission did not want to spend, I think the lowest option was a um, million dollars. Uh, that was, people didn't want to spend that. So if we're looking for a lower option, we may not get it. So that needs to be, you know, if you're going to be realistic, that's where we're at. Um, we did just receive the state grant that will pay for half of the stormwater master plan. And we did allocate money, um, um, in, two, in 2019 to pay for that, um, $200,000. Um, the, there's a problem here is that there's no timeline for how long this is gonna take. So I'm not sure if we're gonna get our results as quickly as we'd like to. And I really like the question answered regarding would the stormwater master plan address these issues and um, provide solutions to, to these issues for Abbott specifically. I, um, so I'd like an answer for that, um, please. And I'll reserve the rest of my time. I have 50 minutes, 50 seconds. Yeah, stop the clock and let's see if uh, we can get an answer for the vice mayor, Jason. Uh, thank you, mayor, vice mayor and commissioners. Uh, yes, I know when we uh, did briefings on this and I, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna say a couple of things and I'm gonna bring on um, there's, I think, two representatives from Keith Engineering that will be on the call that can probably address the questions directly. But yes, to the vice mayor's uh, point, um, we had just uh, been awarded in the past 30 days, I think since, the, 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 since we started negotiating this contract specifically with Keith Engineering um, for the Abbott, we did, were awarded, and, and Senator Pizzo alluded to it, uh, a $107,500 grant. It's a matching 50-50 grant to produce a, a kind of a town-wide drainage analysis. And, and Keith Engineering uh, actually is part of the prior eight part resolution, uh, the commission did approve their contract as the base. So they, they not only won the Abbott Avenue, which is what we're talking about now, but they also won the town-wide pool. And we've already had discussions with them because uh, on Friday, there's a discussion with the uh, grant uh, agency at the state and already engaging with, with uh, Keith Engineering to see if they could take in that scope of services uh, to manage that grant and produce that stormwater master plan, uh, which we had applied for. So, but you had some specific questions uh, on on that, and um, I'm going to ask. Let me see who it is here. We have, I think it's Stephen Williams and Mark Castano. Uh, if um, Jose, if you could let them bring them in both to speak. Yes, this is Steve Williams, uh, Vice President of Engineering at Keith. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, good to see you tonight and uh, appreciate you considering the proposal. Um, I think one of the, the questions that, that you all have raised is that task one, which is the valuation of the, of the prior drainage study. And frankly, one of the prime reasons it's there is that was a part of the RFP that was out. But, but it, it's really not just an evaluation of, of the prior study. It's 
getting in for there's there's information there one of the things we always like to do in any master plans is to take advantage of prior work that the town may have already done there's no reason to duplicate work that's already there so in evaluating that report there's data that we can extract out of that report that we can use so that the work that's been done in the past is not um, thrown away as you would. It, it becomes a part of, of the history of what the project is. So that's that's really the evaluation is there because it wasn't part of the RFP, but also because it's a uh, it, it, there's history there and data that can be used in the new study. Also, in looking at just it, at the study that was done in, on our assessment for going in for the RFP, we noticed there's some areas of the drainage basin, like, like the US one quarter that was not considered in that original study. So we're using portions of the study, but then there's some expansion of the actual drainage basin because the US one quarter is much higher than that property down there. And it's important that that area be considered into any evaluation that's done. So it's taking a look at what was done before, but also adding to it. So with, with that, I, I open up for any further questions. You might have a marker. I Mark is the um, project manager for this for Keith. And any questions you might have, we'd be happy to answer for you. Thank you. Is there another speaker, Jason? I have a question. Okay, but before you ask your question, I think Jason, did you have two gentlemen that wanted to speak? No, they're they're uh, Stephen and Mark are on. They're they'll both right. be here to answer any right. questions. Well, in the we were we were we were in we were in Tina's time, so she, Tina, please continue. No, my question wasn't answered. Uh, will the would the stormwater master plan address these issues on Abbott and provide solutions to these issues? Okay, let's get the, let's get the answer to that question. Okay. Um, as I see it, they're really two different things. The master plan is an overall view of the town, takes a look at things that you all have discussed tonight, you know, raising, what's the cost of raising? What are the alternatives to raising? What can be done? Abbott Avenue, as was advertised by the town and, and the staff has identified areas that have issues. And it's certainly something that the town has looked at in the past. So we know there's an issue there. How can we fix it? And we certainly, um, when you want to spend money, you want to see improvements there. I think that was one of the issues before there was spending money and not a lot of improvements. We want to look at it, spending the money wisely and seeing some improvements. And that was part of some concepts that we laid out in our presentation for the, uh, the RFP. We had some concepts of what we can look at the pumps. There, there's some joint systems that the DOT runs and operates. Um, and it would be taking a look and making sure that the DOT systems aren't contributing to any of those problems that are in there. But to answer your question with the master plan, the master plan, yes, would look at that overall system, but it's not, it, and it identifies other projects and other possible, maybe future type solutions, but it's not going to get to the pressing need that's been identified in the past by the town and the town staff that uh, needs to be addressed right right away. And this first Abbott study actually is producing up to a 30% set of, of drawings for construction plans, you know, for, for uh, solutions to the Abbott Avenue system. Whereas the overall master plan is looking at the town as a whole, taking a look at what's going on. I mean, the town has been affected by the weirs that were put um, for the water quality purposes you know, some years ago into the Bay. So there's all kind of things that gets uh, involved in the master plan that's a bigger picture than what we're looking at specifically for the solution of the Abbott Avenue. Plan. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Tina, continue. Okay, so I just wanted to know because there's no timeline in here. So what, what kind of timeline are we looking for? When would we expect to uh, have, have your um, suggested solutions? Okay, actually, I'm going to call Mark in on this. I know Mark has looked at some of these studies. I don't know if we've actually identified the schedule, but Mark, are you on? Do you want to speak to our schedule on that? Yeah, I'm not hearing Mark. Um, I know we've identified some schedules and certainly we'll work it out with the staff. We're, we're looking at it coming up with, especially on the Abbott Avenue system. I mean, the, the master plan of course is, is 
is uh, not even fully scoped out right now. But the Abbott Avenue, we're, we're looking at something that's going to come up with with some initial studies. I believe it's in that three month time frame, um, and that we, we would have some preliminary information for you in that, okay. that time frame. Tina, I don't have. I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, the schedule in front of me right now. That's okay. Go ahead, Tina. You want to finish up? Um, no, I'll reserve my time. Thank you. Well, your, your, your time is almost over, but did you have a couple more comments? I mean, there's no reserve, there's no time left to reserve, but go ahead. All right, uh, next speaker, Nelly. Uh, yes, um, so my, and I'm glad that you mentioned um, DOT and um, addressing the my possibility of them being um, causing some of this issue right now. Um, I would like that we look at the 94th Street pipe uh, since that's a very large um, pipe that's in that street. And they also have weirs at the end of, of the, the street that run into the, um, into the bay. And there's also a, a pump at the end of 94th Street, um, which, I mean, by no means am I an engineer or anything, but I mean, I do think that having a bigger pipe on Abbott Avenue flowing into 94th Street and that pushing that out to the bay is, could be a solution that I'd like for you guys to take a look on that. Um, I had other questions, but um, I, from, I didn't have uh, time to write them down. So I, I, I kind of give my t uh, uh, for someone else to talk and I'll come back. Stop the clock on the two minutes, Jose. Okay, next speaker, please. Eliana. Hi, okay. Um, if we got, that's great news that we got $100,000 matching grant. I think if we got that money, we would be, um, you know, derelict in not, in not doing that. I mean, it sounds like we just got a 50% off sale on something that can be a real value for the residents and for the town going forward. That's my thought on that. Um, I do think that it feels a little disingenuous when we talk about these other, I mean, we'd all like to think that there's a magical solution, but the truth is, as you can see by the natural disasters on the news and the terrible tragedies around the globe due to you know, global warming and the environmental changes, we are going to be underwater, not in a survivable, habitable capacity. You can't raise your houses or your roads or anything to a level that can beat mother nature. We can't ever beat mother nature. What we can try to do is treat mother nature better and actually do things to help slow global warming or, or hopefully maybe even reverse some of the effects. But, you know, I think that when we talk about raising housing height limits on homes, you know, Jeff Rose brought that up before. If we were sincere in saying, you know, we want to give people building a new home the opportunity to get out away from the water you know, uh, George Kuslis, I remember, gave a great presentation showing that you can already do that with the current height limits. But if, for example, we say, okay, you know what, we want to be super generous and give them even more height, there needs to be the requirement that that area is, in fact, only used to raise the house. Almost, you know, and I know we made fun of Barry Cohn when he said this, Stiltsville, kind of an appeal. But what's going to happen if we raise height limits without mandating how that height is used is you'll just get people, you know, people building bigger and bigger McMansions without taking any environmentally friendly precautions because they truly don't care about that. They're just going to try to exploit the zoning code. And I think that's what we have to be careful about because, you know, we can have great intentions when we say, oh, let's give a foot, get a foot. But the way it's going to be applied and the way it's going to happen is people are just going to give an extra, an extra, extra high ceiling in their dining area or a big entrance way, they're not going to raise their home to be actually away from the water to save, you know, to help the community in some way to, le to let the water go through it to get out faster. So unless we put, we have to be very careful if we make changes like that to, to tie it to requirements that in fact do it. The other thing is raising these houses. A lot of the homes in this town are on concrete slabs. You cannot raise a house on concrete slabs. It, there are some things that can be done. I mean, this has been done up north because the homes there have uh, they have basements. They they have found, you know they have an area underneath crawl spaces. Those homes can be raised. The type of architecture that was prevalent here is not the the kind that's amenable to being moved. So those are my thoughts. I think that we need to be realistic and improving the flooding is a first step. Thanks. 
Uh, I, listen, with all due respect, I just want to say what I heard was utter nonsense. Um, the, the the fact that we're talking about ceiling heights while we're talking about raising houses is ridiculous. Um, people understand that uh, if the houses need to be raised up, it has nothing to do with the height of their ceiling inside. It has to do with the height of the roof because the bottom goes up and then the top goes up. That's how it works. Secondly, um, houses on slabs very likely can be raised up, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say okay, I keep saying okay, but uh, that is uh, also, in my opinion, eminently doable. And I think that it's, it's, uh, it's irresponsible to get on here and make statements like that, that this can be done and this can't be done, uh, especially in light of the fact that uh, I really believe the speakers that are making those statements have no idea what they're talking about. Now, if we get an engineer that comes on and says houses with slabs, cannot be lifted, okay, and it's not possible, then I'll have a different opinion on that. But I haven't heard that at all. So I, I remain very, uh, very, uh, very positive that that can be done. Uh, lastly, um, just to clear up the height issue, uh, I have never talked about uh, height in the residential area. I've talked about height in the commercial area. The buildings on Collins Avenue have been creeping up for a decade now, and we all came in to stop that. Uh, the idea with the height limitations are really mostly applied, or rather only applied, to the uh, Collins Avenue corridor, where I think this commission wants to see all of the buildings that are built from now on at 120 feet. Now, if that means less stories, so be it. But uh, you know, uh, not being able to jam in more stories into a new building that's uh, up and coming is not really our problem. Uh, as far as the residential district goes, I'm absolutely supportive of raising the height issue uh, in the residential district in order to accommodate the, uh, the flood level issue. So that's something, and, and that absolutely should be part of the new zoning code. And that absolutely should be worked out and I have discussed that with George Kuslis at length. And uh, George has some great ideas on that. And that should be put into the new code. And we should encourage the houses to be raised up. And we should encourage all the new houses um, to be built responsibly and at a level where they will be sustainable and resilient. Those are my comments. Now, I think we've gone around one time. Do we want to go around one more time on this um, subject? Because, I'm on. okay. Yeah, I think Nelly, I wrote, you had two minutes left of your time. Okay, but um, if, let, let's get your two minutes done and then we'll find out if the commission wants to go around one more time. Go ahead, Nelly. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, I remember in regards to the $9,000, I remember the presentation was only a few pages and really they only gave us three options. I, I just don't understand why, if they were only giving us three options, why do we, does it take $9,000 worth of work to look at those three options, which didn't throw a major change in the flooding situation on Abbott Avenue? That's where I have my issue. And um, so that I would like that answered. Um, and also in terms of um, basements in the north, yes, they are made of concrete. So uh, things that are made of concrete, if they can be uh, lifted over there, I'm sure they can be lifted over here. I think what we need to do is start getting professional opinions from engineers, not people that went to school for, uh, to law school or journal school. I don't think that, that those qualifications give you the right to make statements that are inaccurate. Um, in terms of raising the houses, I think it's a good idea. I don't think it's the, the best solution because, um, also you have cars. What are going to happen with the vehicles that are on the street that is being flooded? This is where the problem really lies. I think we definitely first before raising any houses, I think we need to fix the plumbing issues, uh, the pipe issues, and, um, then we can focus on raising the houses. But I, I do think that that's a very good option. Um, and I'd like my question answered. Thank you. Okay, Jason, go ahead. And then we'll see if we're gonna go around again because it's getting late folks. We've got lots of other things on the agenda. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll try to make it brief. Uh, yes, the CGA report, which was uh, the Abbott Avenue 90 to 93rd, is a 213 page uh, report, though there was a presentation summary done to the commission that summarized those three items. So there is a lot of data there, but I will ask um, uh, uh, the gentleman from Keith uh, to, to speak on that because I know it's really an all inclusive issue, but are you still there? Yes, this is Steve okay. Williams with Keith. Um, again, back, back on the, it's basically data gathering on information that's already been um, gathered by the, the town. And we're, we're utilizing that existing information so we don't have to recreate it. There's information in there on the pipes, pipe sizes, the inverse grades, elevations. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, it didn't include all, all of the Collins US-1 corridor or even that development, the new high rises developments gone on that you just referred to. That water, a lot of that storm water that overflows their systems makes its way downhill. There, there's a, a grade difference, as I'm sure you're aware. One of the big issues at Abbott is one of the lowest areas there. It actually comes down, dips at Abbott, goes up again before it starts falling down towards the, uh, the bay. So those are some of the things where we're utilizing the information. We're basically building our database for our study because the second phase is evaluation an assessment of all of this data. So that task one is evaluating what was done before, taking in additional information. There's LIDAR information, which is, is elevation data. Um, and there's information that's on the town's MS4, which is the, the drainage permit that uh, categorizes all the outfalls. And then there's get with DOT to find out further information about their systems, their pumps, their pipes. So it, it's categorized as evaluation of the, uh, prior report, but it's really the data gathering. And so that we don't have to recreate information for this study, for the assessment that we're doing in task two. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, Vice Mayor, do you wanna to move to go around again and have more comments? I, ha I have 30 seconds left, that's all I need. Okay, you didn't have 30 seconds left. But I you did. Said, you did, go ahead. I, I just, I... <laughs> Basically, I wanted to ask, um, similar to what Commissioner Velasquez just asked, um, regarding tasks one and two, because um, as Mr. Williams had stated, the work was, I mean, the work was done by CGA, except for, um, you know, what Mr. Williams had stated. So I'm just wondering, is, is there, I mean, the work's there, uh, they reviewed it in order to uh, answer the RFQ or RFP. And I'm just wondering what can be done like to, just fill in, the, fill in the missing parts. You know, it seems like a lot to look at work that was previously done. It's 213 page report and uh, tasks one and two work were completed except for what was missing. So I'd like, you know, definitely add what was missing, but um, just wondering if we can do better on this. Yeah, I mean, the one point that I, I could bring up there is that yes, we can utilize it. And yes, there is value from what the town has done before that we don't have to recreate from scratch but state law does require that we basically adopt, um, it, it, you know, if we're using somebody else or we're using the prior data, we have to um, base, basically take a look at the calcs from scratch. So they become our calcs and we become totally responsible for whatever's done. We can't just say, oh, this is a study that was done by somebody else and, and we're gonna use it and move ahead where then um, the responsibility of that is somebody else's. It, it will be totally our responsibility but we're able to utilize data that the town has secured before once we're familiar with it and see the, uh, and have gone through the information and added to, like we said, the, the Collins Avenue, US-1 corridor as well. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, get a motion here to uh, move this item or go around again for another three minutes or, yes, yeah, Sandra, go ahead. Mayor, um, there is a motion on the to approve the item. I'm sorry? There is a motion on the table to approve this item. There is a, mo oh, we're in discussion right now? Okay, what was the motion exactly to approve the that? The motion was to approve, to move. For, it was Commissioner Velasquez, seconded by Commissioner Kessel. Okay, Commissioner Kessel, you had a comment? Uh, yes, I just have one critical question of Mr. Williams based on something that he said and I, and I need to ask it. Um, Mr. Williams, you said that the prior study did not include the Florida A1A corridor um, which includes runoff downhill one block to Abbott. Um, 
how would that impact the, the study to begin with? Wouldn't that have to be included in order to know how much water is going a block down into the lower street? Uh, we, we believe it, it's imperative that that corridor be considered in it. When I say it's not considered the, uh, the, the storm, the model, the stormwater model that was done for that, there was not that basin was not considered a part of the ICPR uh, model that was prepared for it. But you're right, there, some of it bypasses the area entirely in a DOT-owned system. Um, but one of the things, you're know, coming from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, like an Abbott, I put a catch basin in that system, it may bubble up out of that structure into that. So uh, uh, in that case, a catch basin, like you think of it, as that's where the water's gonna flow into, but if it's coming from a higher elevation, it actually flows out of that. So you're right, you do need to consider that. And that's what we're saying. We need to consider that water that's coming off of the US-1 corridor in, in our analysis. Yes, sir. And actually a bright, a bright idea that came up in this commission earlier, which I advocated was, um, was as simple as a berm um, because to feed the water onto the A1A corridor in those larger um, state owned and operated and supported pipes. Yes, sir. Um, and, um, and I think that I mean, we can wait three months for your analysis, but I imagine that that would be something that you would support as a common sense initiative too. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I think coordinating with DOT right up front, especially, you know, as we come to, you know, it's finally quit raining, right? We, we didn't think it would happen in October, but it did. But come May, June, it's going to start raining again. And so the sooner we can coordinate with DOT, make sure their systems are cleaned out and operating properly, those are the type of things that can happen early on that you don't really need to study or even need to move the plan. It's just making sure the town's done a great job of doing that coordination. It's just to go ahead and make sure that that is continued to, to be coordinated with DOT on those systems to make sure that they're not contributing to that Abbott Avenue flooding. Okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, Eliana, we're going around again, go ahead. Um, I have a question, and when I have a question, I want my time to freeze if he answers it. Are you saying that the Calvin Giordano study did not take into account the, the water runoff coming from that corridor? And you can freeze my clock now. The, Jose, can you stop? the computer model Whoever, was uh, done. Uh, hold on. Not... All right, can you stop? He has to go back to 245 and stop no, no, my no. clock. Commissioner, it Sorry, takes Commissioner. We're humans here. It, it takes a few seconds to stop the clock. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. Yes, that corridor was not in the ICPR computer stormwater model that we received. So that is an area that we have to consider. And, and possibly it was not in there because it's a separate DOT owned system that bypasses or supposedly bypasses a lot of the residential area and has its own discharge. So that might have been one of the reasons. But what happens is we do get storms that exceed the capacity of our stormwater systems. And when, when the stormwater system capacity is exceeded, it, it overland flows. And in our, the case of Collins Avenue US-1 corridor, it overland flows downhill and basically ends up in the Abbott Avenue. Okay, so the question is, we're, we're paying you to come up with solutions for Abbott Avenue, correct? That's what we're doing? Yes, so ma'am. I don't, we already heard the Kevin Giordano solutions and none of them were good. And so I don't see why we need to pay $9,000 for that because we already have that. So I'd rather, I mean, I think we can save $9,000 and you can then, the, you know, you guys are going to come up with some great creative solutions, which I'm looking forward to. I don't think that I agree with Tina that that $9,000 seems like a waste of money. Um, it's also a two, it's literally a 213 page document. It, it, if you want to look at it and, and benefit from that, I think that's great, but I don't think it should be $9,000 to read it. That's just my thoughts. Um, now I want to respond to some of the other comments. Uh, first of all, it's not journal school, it's journalism. And second of all, I would like the mayor to not be so disrespectful as to think I don't know what I'm talking about. What I said is not about the ceiling heights in homes. What I said is if you give someone an extra foot, it has to be mandated that they use that foot to actually be higher off the ground so that the water goes out, not so they can have an even higher roof deck or an even higher uh, ceiling in their rooms. The point is the only reason to give people the permission to go higher, because again, 
not everyone is going to be going higher and we have to be aware of the whole neighborhood and the neighbors. These homes are already huge and they tower over the neighbors. If you allow them to go even higher, it has to be in the code mandatory that that space is not habitable space, that that extra foot be not habitable only to raise the home up so that the water um, does not go into the home. Because otherwise, if we don't put that in there as a mandatory requirement, you will have people just building bigger homes without taking any environmental precautions. And second of all, um, I do have Google and I didn't go to engineering school, but I've been looking at this issue for months ever since those lovely videos popped up on Nextdoor about seven or eight months ago. So I've, I have been looking into this. The, the idea of raising these homes is lovely in practicality. It is a bit of a um, logistical nightmare for the neighbors, for sure. Um, for each, the, even the homeowner and the cost of not just having to raise it um, and rebuild a floor, because if a house is on a slab, it, it would have to be, the slab is, is, is the ground floor, is, the, is their living room. You would have to make a whole new floor and break it. It's, it's, it's not such a simple thing like where you, if there was a crawl space and then the floor and you could raise it. This is all very googly, you know, easily uh, researched. So I did that. Um, that's all. But I do think we need to do the stormwater master plan for the residents, especially since we have the grant. Thanks. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to go, Tina. Um, because the commissioner mentioned the floor. It's real simple. If you raise the first floor because you want to get it up and out of the water, okay, everything else goes up, relatively speaking, okay? It has nothing to do with the interior of the house. No one's going to be sneaking anything by. Bottom line is, the first floor goes up. The first floor goes up, and that means everything above that first floor goes up relatively the same height. It's easy. It's not complicated. Okay. Um, the uh, you know the, the 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 raising of that. Listen, we could sit here and come up with all the challenges and problems associated, and you you outlined them you know very nicely, Commissioner, um, with raising the houses. There's no doubt. It logistically, it's challenging, okay? But it's more challenging logistically to have two inches of water throughout your first floor of your home, okay? That's what we're talking about here. So we're trying to move the ball forward. We're not trying to throw roadblocks up wherever we can just because we don't like the person who's proposing a certain item. I'll reserve the rest of my time in a minute and 47 seconds. Go ahead, Tina. Okay, so I, I just want to clarify uh, a few things. First of all, the conversation is about the avid drainage, not raising houses. I've also looked into raising houses, but I won't discuss that tonight. Um, I would just say that, um, you know, tasks one and two equals $21,720. And essentially it's um, looking at the CGA study that this firm has already looked at minus the a1a that was not included so um that's uh sorry i lost my train of thought here i, I had a question oh uh, so my question is to mr williams having read the cga report uh how much of how much of a difference can we expect from your report mm -hmm. because this is a lot of money for essentially another report Right. The um, that task one is 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 more than just the evaluation of that that report. There there's several items in there. There's um, and I, it, I'm sure it must be a part of your of your. It's on page 314 of your, of your packet there, and it gives there's an A B C D and E. It does talk about evaluating the report and what's there, but there's also several other items in there as far as you know, looking at the MS4 gathering data from the town uh, as far as what's available on the existing drainage wells, the what's going on with those wells, um, the historical complaints that they've gotten in the area so you get a good feel for it. So there, there's a number of things on that page 314 that really details what is in that task one. And, and it's more than just reading that 213 page report from Calvin Giordano, it's basically building the base that we have to go into the next task, which is an assessment of what's there, building our own model for that system and coming up with the recommended solutions for the town. So um, I, thank you for that. 
Um, I'm muted. Wait. No, we can hear you, Tina. Okay. <laughs> the computer said I was. Um, so based on that, what what I'm just wondering because you have seen you have um, Mr. Williams, you have reviewed the CGA report. So I just you know I just want to know what what can we really expect from your report? How much more detail? How much of a different solution? Uh, is there? Do you have an idea at this point that you could give us? I, I can't give you what the um, the solutions are right now. Um, we presented some ideas of, as, as far as how we might be able to approach it. One was as we talked about making sure that the US one Collins Avenue corridor water bypasses this area. It uh, does not get short stopped there by the little rise that happens just west of Abbott Avenue. So it's one of the solutions we would be looking at, making sure that those drainage pipes that are coming down there don't have catch basins there where water can flow out of rather than into. So those are some of the things we're looking at. The wells, there are several different wells. Um, part of it may be to make see if we can have wells that may be up on the, the Collins Avenue US-1 quarter that intercepts the water, puts them back in to the groundwater at an elevation where it's worthwhile. Once you get down into the lower elevations, the wells can actually operate efficiently because saltwater wells require basically a foot and a half to two foot of head or water above the well before you can push the water in because salt water is, uh, he is heavier than, than that, or fresh water is lighter than, than the salt water, so it takes more head. But if you do it uphill where you have elevation, you can now put water in a well. So one of the solutions would be, can we intercept some of that water with wells and making sure the DOT wells are, you know, operating and functioning properly? So those are just some of the ideas that we explored in the presentation that we went through and that we would explore in more detail with, with the study. Okay, thank you. And um, last question, I think, is that, um, oh, well, I should have wrote it down. Uh, just a second. Um, okay, come back to me. <laughs> okay, and Nellie, do you have a comment? No, that that that's happened to me as well. I had a very good question, and then I didn't write it down, and I lost it. But Tina's Tina's comments were spot on, and and I agree with uh, with 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 what she was mentioning, and some great questions there. I think uh, what Tina, I, uh, Tina, correct me if I'm wrong. I think what you're trying to get at is for the money we're going to spend. Can we expect some really creative, interesting new solutions and ideas? Um, and and it, if that wasn't your your direction, that that's my direction, because you know the the bottom line is is that we're going to be spending nine thousand plus seventy three thousand. Is it, Jason? Is that correct? Total of uh, about seventy three thousand to complete the entire task. They're, they're listed as three tasks, but they're all needed together. All right, to get, so we're going to spend $70,000 to, to, um, to, uh, to get a final analysis, another set of eyes looking at the global problem of solving, you know, our drainage. I, I think that, you know, again, I'm going to go ahead and vote for this because we promised this um, when we were elected and it's the least we can do for the town to add to the discussion as far as adding more ideas and more discussion topics at the very least. And I think that is the very least because I think at the very most, we'll have much more in depth um, information that this gentleman was talking about. So uh, I'm gonna vote for it. However, I mean, if, if we're not doing the $9,000 component, I don't think that's the end of the world. Um, although I think it might be short-sighted to not let them um, review all that data and consider it as uh, part of the big uh, picture solution. So um, uh, again, I had asked, it, uh, quite frankly, I want to be honest, I had asked, um, why isn't the clock running? I had asked that, um, that the residents let me know how they felt about it because personally, I, I would have thought that, you know, if we could have applied the 73,000 toward the fund that's going to start to lift up houses, that might have been a better application of the money, but that wasn't my call to make because I'm not the one with flood water in my living room right now. So what they said was the, the ones that I talked to want to go ahead with this study and they want to get an answer. 
anyway, that's that's my two cents. So let's go around again. Uh, Tina, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I remember my question now. So um, what I wanted to know, uh, Mr. Williams, is how will this project integrate into the mass, uh, stormwater master plan so that yes. we don't duplicate the work? Right. Certainly the information that we gather for the Abbott Avenue and its corridor will be incorporated into the master plan. The master plan, I think, as we spoke earlier, covers a much broader scope for the town than this Abbott Avenue drainage system, but certainly there's a lot of data and information that's going to be pulled together with this Abbott Avenue that will be utilized in that master plan. And the master plan looks at projects, um, concept projects, looks at other solutions that may address your cost for raising or the feasibility or not feasibility of raising streets or homes or things like that. And that's what the master plan gets into evaluating and then presents that data for the town to make a decision on which way they may want to go. But that data that's done for Abbott Avenue is definitely going to be utilized in the master plan. Okay, thank you. I'd like to reserve my time for the next uh, topic. Okay, next speaker. I have a question. Okay, Nellie, go ahead. Um, being that we're pushing this master plan, which we had already said that we weren't going to do back in March, and CGA, and we've just heard this engineer firm also say that we don't need to have... Now, my question here is, if we did a master plan in 2013, why is it that making another master plan, which pretty much is using the same pipes that were there from 2013, why does this cost $200,000? When you already have a master plan from 2013 that you would only be adding the additional pipes that you're talking on Collings Avenue of the hotels, is that correct? I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused here because that's an enormous amount of money to spend on a master plan that we already have. Okay, Jason, stop, stop the, the clock. clock. Jose, I have okay. one minute and a couple, couple things. Stop the, are we, are we voting on a $200,000 expenditure tonight? No, but it's no. being brought up this master plan and master plan and asking the same question okay. over and over. I just, I just want to clarify that. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, item 9W on the, the, uh, the agenda is the staff report that was requested by the commission back in June to come back with information on, to answer the question as the commissioner said, are we actually required to? And um, not that I, I wanna get off topic, I'll make it very quick because this will come back in a few months. We bring the grant award uh, at a new scope for that, for the commission to, to determine. Uh, but on page five, 425, I know the attorney Lily and uh, CGA had done that analysis and that um, it looks like based on what I'm, the summary of what I'm seeing there is that by Florida statute, if you run a stormwater utility, you are required to have a stormwater master plan. And what it says here is that the town completed some, uh, a ICPR model back in 2008. And it does say that the best practice uh, by local governments, by the, M, the national MPDS uh, plan is to update your stormwater master plan every five to 10 years to take into account changes in the environment, changes in buildings that have been built. So the last model was updated, I guess, in 2008 and I guess I'm hearing from the vice mayor, there was some mention about 2013. The town has obviously uh, changed a lot in there. But this is, a set, is the mayor is absolutely correct. This is a separate topic. This will come back. Uh, we did were awarded $107,500 towards a matching grant to do a townwide drainage. Okay, we'll so given back. that, Nelly, let's let's try to stay on the topic of the engineers. Go ahead and finish your time if you like. No, just want to make sure that we do give the um, the time needed for the Abbott Avenue drainage, which is really what this is all about. Okay. I mean, I've already been waiting an enormous amount of time um, and they shouldn't be waiting any longer. And I wanna make sure that if you're telling us that within three months, you're gonna have this report, that it's gonna be in three months so that we can start planning to decide what we're gonna do. So we start giving relief to our residents that have this problem every time it rains. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Charles? Uh, yep. And I don't need a full clock. Um, I asked right. a couple questions as part of the round. I just want to say, um, you know, Abbott Avenue was, was left behind when the other pumps were put in. 
because it was too challenging. And it makes sense for me to spend this money to do a deeper dive with another firm as we directed the town staff to arrange for us. Um, and uh, it seems like the, um, the firm is competent. So let's call the vote. Okay, that's a good idea. I, I, I don't see Commissioner Salzhauer anymore. Is, is she out of the meeting? Anybody? And to log in with her computer right now. She's trying to log in. Okay, well, uh, we're going to call the question. We'll wait a couple minutes for her because I okay. think that she, go ahead, Tina. You had some time left. Sure. Why, yeah, why? I, I just wanted to state that, um, you know, in, in the CGA report, I, it, it mentions that they used the 2013 stormwater master plan. And if we're uh, looking at what Mr. Williams said about how he needs to review everything that CGA did, and um, he stated that uh, the Collins corridor, I guess, was left off. And, uh, you know, he's going to be reviewing the 2013 plan, but as, as um, our finance director state, or assistant manager stated, the um, plan needs to be updated every five to 10 years. So that puts us at it was seven years ago. So um, should be done. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think we're ready to vote, but I don't see. Uh, okay. There she is. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the question? Yes, Mayor Commissioner Velasquez. Well, before you do that, I'm confused about exactly what we're voting for. Are we voting for the, the full package or are we voting for the edited package? Who made the motion? For the full package. The vice mayor made the motion and I seconded it. Okay, and that was for the full package? Commissioner um, Velasquez made the motion and Commissioner Castle seconded. Oh, sorry. And, and yes, for the full, full package. Okay, yes. so for the full package. Okay, call the question, please. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Commissioner Salazar? Yes. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? He's frozen. Yes. Yeah, okay. She's, I think she said yes. I think so too. Okay. Mayor Pitt? Yes. Mayor, the motion carries. Very good. Okay. Um, we uh, took that item and we were also, Mr. Manager, you were going to, are you going to take us through the uh, item E? It's the, uh, on page two. May, if I may read the title into the record? Yeah. The budget amendment. It's item 3E, fiscal year 2021, budget amendment oh. number five, a resolution of the town commission of the town of Surrey, Florida. Approving budget amendment number five for the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget, providing for implementation and in providing for an effective date, item 3E. Thank you. Is there a motion to move that item? Charles? I'll second yep, it. I'll motion to move. Thanks, Okay, Nelly. can somebody tell our residents exactly what it is, please? Jason? Jason? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, there are two items. One is to add the um, what you just voted on uh, to actually fund that the um, the seventy three thousand two twenty for the stormwater uh, Abbott Avenue drainage project, and the second item is adding twenty four thousand eight hundred dollars uh, to the water and sewer fund uh, from current reserves to cover uh, repairs for sewer pumps. Uh, we had a couple of uh, pump damages, and we wanted to top off that budget allocation to ensure we are prepared. Thank you. Is there any discussion about that, commissioners? Okay, call the question, please. Commissioner Salazar? Yes. Commissioner Castle? Yes. Commissioner Velasquez? Yes. Vice Mayor Paul? Yes. Mayor Riquet? Yes. Mayor the motion carries. Thank you. Um, Mr. Manager, Madam Attorney, do you have any reports that you'd like to give us? Uh, not at this time, Mayor, just what's in the written report. Thank, Thank you. you. No, sir. Okay. I think we're making progress. Now we're up to uh, item 9A, COVID update. Uh, Commissioner Kessel, can you give us an update? Um, yes. Thank you, sir. Um, obviously, COVID continues to be challenging um, over the last month uh, when our downtown business district has been jumping, which we're really happy to see. Uh, we're happy to see that business is good downtown, but it prevents the challenge when folks um, do not wear masks and they do not do social distancing. Um, it's obviously a health threat to everyone. 
um, and it's also a um, you know a threat to the to the businesses themselves and their and their uh, vitality. Um, Commissioner Velasquez um, may be happy to hear that, um, not to read your mind, but based on something you said, I think at the last meeting, uh, we're no longer having the specific team meetings of the COVID task force. Um, COVID has become such um, a part of everyday um, town affairs that, um, that I state, I keep posted as necessary, um, but we are not having regular meetings. It's something that, that has filtered through every part of the town. Um, with that, um, I'll toss it to uh, our town manager who has some specific numbers about how um, enforcement has picked up. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, um, we continue to be um, on, the, on, the, on the cutting edge. <laughs> That's not the right word on the forefront. Uh, every time it seems like I go down there to pick something up for lunch, there's people without masks on, there's people, you know, pull, you know, with, with them on, pulled down with, in their hands. It's not necessarily a situation where people don't have them. It's just a situation where people aren't wearing them. So I know that uh, last week, code enforcement uh, went business to business down there and they talked about uh, fines. Um, first fine of $250, second fine of $500 and a potential shutdown of business. Uh, for, I know Miami Beach has done that for a 24 hour period. We, we don't want to do things like that. We've gone back in the last couple of days and talked about the social, the spacing, the social distancing, you know, constant reminders, the police department, the chief uh, Euro is, is on here if, uh, if, if you need any information from him, but they're down there. I know through the end of uh, about uh, the last week of uh, uh, 2020 for about a 50 day period, they conducted 125 mass details and gave out 2,500 verbal warnings and had, you know, citizen contact. So it, you know, we're down there. It's just, um, you know, one thing we we've discussed as a staff, you know, you have people sitting on the sidewalks dining and people walking by without mask right beside them. So, you, you know, you've got that situation, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily think that, uh, um, you know, it, it would be a, a, a fan favor to take away sidewalk dining, but obviously if that's a, is that, if that's an option, this commission chooses to do, then that's an option. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're out there more and more, uh, it seems like every week, every day, and, um, you know, uh, doing the best um, that, that our staff um, can possibly do without being there, you know, 16 hours a day, physically right there, 16 hours a day. Thank you. Chief Hero is there if you have any questions for the chief. Nellie? I just have a comment on um, the outdoor dining. Um, I had, uh, we had spoken about this um, um, one day when there was that enormous amount of people mm -hmm. and there was garbage all over the place and people not wearing masks. Um, I think uh, a good solution for the outdoor dining, as they've been doing in other cities, um, including New York, Miami Beach, is having a area by the, instead of having specific parking, take that parking and put like a, um, like a, like a booth that they even use in Europe and, uh, and this so that all that um, tables and everything that are on our sidewalk are pushed over to the parking area for the time being until we're completely out of this and and um, restaurants can go back to their normal um, setting and have their uh, business taken back inside the restaurant. Um, I think that that would be a solution for um, our our um, our uh, restaurants instead of like I said having them on the sidewalk where it causes um, um, lack of mobility between people passing down the dis the district, and then you also definitely have a lot of people not wearing the masks. And, and like I said, that was mostly uh, people that came from other cities. Um, so that's that's my point on that. And uh, thank you very much. That's you're doing a great job. I think uh, this is good. So another question that I have is, so now being that this is being passed on to the town manager we're no longer having this COVID task force update because I think that we all know about COVID. Is that correct, Charles? So um, you're that's a canceled. Great question. That's a great question to be uh, considered for the for the committee. I, we could vote on it. Um, I um, because I have have been the liaison. 
um, I'm comfortable continuing to, to do that role. Um, and I could answer your questions directly actually. And then the chief can jump in if, if he has anything else to add, but related to the, to the sidewalk dining, um, where that's been done, for example, in South Beach on Washington um, is a different area than A1A um, where everything goes through, through, um, through FDOT. And, um, and then there's also the notion of the dining tables with the speeding traffic. Um, and cause we had talked about that on the task force previously and, um, and spacing it out, we unanimously thought, you know, with Chief Euro in the conversation, of course, that that was kind of not a direction that was feasible for the town um, to answer that question. And then um, in terms of the task force, I'll leave it at the commission's discretion of whether it's disbanded or not. Um, but at this point, um, I'm comfortable with it doing so. I said that I would bring that up um, and I would, and comfortable saying that we would hand it over to the town when necessary. So I'm comfortable bringing that up, certainly. And, um, and I think that the town is doing a really good job, you know, stepping up the, uh, the, the challenge of, of enforcing the rules to keep people safe, which is not easy. Thank you, Charles. Next speaker, Tina. Uh, thank you. And yes, I'd, I'd like to first thank uh, the town manager and the police chief and the code enforcement um, department head for uh, stepping in right away because I, I know uh, all of us were uh, contacting you pretty much daily for probably the past month regarding the situation in the business district and, and other things. Um, I noticed really, because I'm near the Marriott Hotel, so I noticed really it is mostly the hotel traffic and I have seen a slight improvement. So please keep doing what you're doing. Keep monitoring the restaurants for compliance with the table distancing. Um, I'm all for putting the uh, tables in the parking spots, but I, I understand that there's a lot of logistics and safety issues. Um, but I mean, in all seriousness, we had an issue with the sidewalk cafes taking up too much room prior to COVID when, uh, during busy season. So uh, I'm happy the businesses are, are doing well. It's great. And I don't want to see them penalized, but we really do need the cooperation because it, it takes a village. It takes all of us. Um, and, and so we, we need to be uh, vigilant about this and keep this up and, and keep telling people to please wear the masks and please social distance and please respect the space of others. So uh, thank you and don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, Eliana? Yeah, thank you very much for doing this. And thank you, Charles. I, I, I definitely want to keep the COVID task force. I think that COVID, it's not, you know, COVID is far from over, unfortunately. I would love to, I would love it to be over. But I think with the, um, sorry, hold on. This is, give me one second. Um, okay, I'm going to go after the next person. I have to take this call. Sorry, just freeze my time and I'll come back. All right. Um, I'd just like to say, listen, I want to give the, the chief a shout out and the manager a shout out. I had a, at least two calls this week um, with people that I thought were going to read me the riot act, but instead they told me what an amazing job our city's doing. Um, you know, we're out there, we're encouraging people to move their cars. We're encouraging people to wear masks. Uh, our police, and our staff are being polite and firm and we're educating our residents and our tourists. And for that, I think uh, I'm very proud because that's exactly um, the, uh, the, the decorum that I wanted to see out there because it reflects so well on us. It's all of us, it, it just really says who we are. I mean, we're out there trying to help people and make it better. And uh, kudos to everybody that's uh, been pulling on that uh, that team. Okay, yes, Mr. Manager. Uh, just one other thing. Um, I'm just speaking with Carmen, I made a note. Uh, they've given out 34 warnings to businesses and two I mean, two civil uh, violations, two different businesses for uh, um, not adhering to the social distancing uh, new. Um, requirements that we have out there. And also we're going to uh, take up the Senator on his offer to get those masks. So we're going to add to our inventory and, and continue to, you know, we'll, we'll take them, but you know, we'll, we'll continue to hand them out and, and then pick those up that are on the, on the ground uh, that, that get dropped. Cause we are picking up 
not a lot, but but masks, you know, do get dropped. So we're, we're very proud of Thank you. you, Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go to the uh, to the speakers, but I'm gonna reduce it to two minutes because we're getting late now. So um, would you put? I'm, the I'm back now. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Can I finish my? What I was gonna say? Sorry, I had to take that. Um, sorry. What I was saying before is that um, the this there's a safety concern i know that we talked about sidewalks and using that parking lane there's a safety concern with that i know we had problems and this this happened in new york it happened in europe where cars um and you know we had a terror and not we had a, an incident a safety incident this week but it's a, a very bad uh safety problem for cars and diners especially you know it's a it's a they have concrete barriers in new york and in other places for exactly that reason because it's very easy to use a car as a weapon to hurt people. So I don't think that's something we should waste time pursuing because it's dangerous. Um, I do think the idea of being, you know, and I know we this is not the time to talk about it, was if you use the area behind the, the restaurants, that would be a lovely courtyard. I mean, there's so much we could do if we flipped it where we would have the outside dining towards the back instead of garbage dumps back there, but that's for another discussion. Regarding the COVID, I do think we have to keep the pressure up I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to get the compliance because, you know, this pandemic has taken a huge toll on on me personally, on my family. It's been it's been horrible, like the worst nightmare ever. And it's really important that everybody take this seriously because the longer this goes on, the more problems we're going to have. This could be years. This is not a matter of just rolling out a vaccine because there's uh, mutations, etc. So it's very serious, and we need to stay on top of it. Okay. Um, I've said that from the get-go. I thank you, Commissioner Kessel, for doing this. I want to continue to stay on top of it. I love that the town manager is taking um, this seriously and that our police are taking it seriously, and we need to stay on top of it. I don't want to hear from residents, oh, I saw all this going on, and then we take it seriously. I think we need to take it seriously every day until this is hopefully um, you know, a bad memory and it's all over. But until that time, I really appreciate that we enforce, and and if, you know, if they're not going to listen, then we start issuing the citations, et cetera. I think we've already talked about that. Thanks. Matt, uh, Madam Clerk, would you call the first speaker, please, for two minutes? Yes, Mayor. The first speaker will be, the first speaker is Jeff Rose. Jeff, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. Jeff Rose, 8851 Fraud Avenue. Um, I want to thank the town manager, the police chief, and code enforcement, because I actually saw them a couple times in the downtown district. and. It's the, it's 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 a uh, it's terrorists. It's, I don't think it's the residents. So uh, I really do appreciate them going out there and uh, protecting the residents. Um, piggybacking on what Commissioner Velasquez said, um, expanding into the streets is actually a great idea. And the downtown business district actually, or the the, the board had some ideas that they're probably going to bring up to you guys in the next meeting or two about potentially doing some of that as as more of a long term thing potentially as COVID could be around for a little bit. And one of the other things I want to ask, since we are in the COVID uh, topic, is there an ETA on when we're going to be going back to in-person meetings? Is I know we obviously are still in COVID and the state of emergency, but what's the status of in-person meetings in the next month or two, or, or are we going to be staying um, on Zoom for, for the for the foreseeable future? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Joshua Epstein. Joshua, please state your name and address for the record and your comments. Joshua Epstein, 9317 Bay Drive. Um, first, I want to say, obviously, keep the task force together. I was concerned to even hear that brought up. I think there's more people dying every day than died on 9-11, so I don't think this is something. For 15 minutes, 30 minutes every meeting, we spend hours on topics that don't really have an impact, and we're not... I mean, they have an impact, but not people dying on ventilators and becoming sick. So I think this is a, most, a very important issue that 15, 30 minutes a meeting is not that much to allocate to it. Um, regarding the enforcement, finally, thank you to our police department for enforcing it. I know it's been, I don't know how many months without any enforcement, so that's a great thing to see. Um, and then with the 2,500 verbal warnings, I think it's obviously great verbal warnings, but because these are tourists, these are not people who are going to violate it multiple times. They're going to go here and violate it somewhere else. So I'd be supportive of just lowering maybe the fine that can't be collected until afterwards to so like $5. So it's something that can be given out in mass so that you're not wearing your mask you get a $3 fine, just something. It's not going to be the monetary value, but just getting stuck with a police officer giving you a citation takes time. I know I saw um, somebody post on next door that even if they don't get a ticket, getting pulled over by a cop is a discouragement to speed because it just takes time out of their day. And no, no tourist wants to be stopped by police and get like a $5 citation. 
Um, I think regarding the businesses, I think that's something that we obviously should be um, harsh on. I don't think that's something where with lives at risk, I don't think we should be lenient and say, here's an exception this time, this time. Um, regarding the, the dining in the, in the parking spots, I think that's a good idea. I would be kind of concerned just because I know, I just think that that's a, just an easy way for somebody to just drive in and plow and kill a lot of people if it's not done properly. So I would like to see if that was done, I think just make sure that the police department like okays it and that it's adequate safety measures so that if somebody drives into it, their car is going to get wrecked, not 20 people are going to get killed. Um, I think it's a good idea. Maybe looking at getting rid of the outdoor dining. I don't think there's a problem right now with filling these restaurants. These restaurants are packed. Maybe having one table, but the entire sidewalk can't be outdoor dining. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Diana Rosales. Diana, please take your name and address for the record and your comments. Yeah, Diana Gonzalez, 9325 Dickens Avenue. Uh, I want to thank you, Andy, for the effort that you are doing and the police and everyone, but keep doing because it's impossible to walk by the sidewalk. It's really there are a lot of people from other places right now, and it's impossible. The restaurants, they have all the tables together. They already took the whole sidewalks. In many places, it's impossible even to walk. Thank you for doing that and keep doing that because they are doing anyway. They are filling with more tables, more tables, and then the cars, double parking, etc. Thank you for the work because you are doing the work. I don't say that you are not doing the work. You are doing that, but you have to keep doing. Because be, like you mentioned before, educating people is really hard. And, and I want to say that, that I see it every day because I walk every day by that area and I had to escape in now because I escaped that and I tried to go in other places, impossible. Thank you, Castle, for the work that you did in COVID, but really the, all the information, COVID is all over the places right now and the people is checking different places. I think, thank you, thank you so much for your work too. But I, in this point, COVID is going to be part of the news and it's going to be part of our lives and every single place there is information about it. But thank you anyway for the job that you did. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Diana. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is George Kusulas. George, please say your name and address for the record and your comments. George Kusulas, 9225 Collins Avenue. I wanted to address the, the seating in the uh, parking lane. Um, as a temporary issue, it has all kinds of problems. I know the DVAC, the DVAC committee is looking at it right now and probably is going to address it again in their March meeting. And then you may see some of their recommendations coming out of that. But that's a more permanent uh, solution that they're looking at because uh, imagine this, if you're sitting at any cafe table and the parking isn't there and instead you have a travel lane where cars are typically going 40 miles per hour. Uh, it is not a place you want to be. You essentially need the equivalent of a Jersey barrier uh, in that uh, location, something that'll take a, a 10,000 pound load at 18 inches to protect uh, anybody seated there. So uh, it's not an easy solution and it, it's an unwise solution. And obviously the police department has already weighed in on that, but a permanent uh, approach to that that actually incorporates a nice planter or something that, that does the job of the Jersey barriers, something you should be looking at. And uh, if not at, in the entire lane, at least in areas where it might be helpful and, and augment uh, cafe seating and get it out of the travel path of the sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you, George. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, it's Horace Henderson. Horace, please state your name and address for the record in your comments. Good evening, Horace Henderson, 9195 Collins Ave. Um, I do want to thank the employees, uh, the police chief, uh, the town manager, et cetera. Uh, all of them are, are doing a, a very tough job and, and, and quite frankly, a thankless job because uh, again, the tourists are coming to town and et cetera. Uh, we all know that. Um, but what I'd really like to do is, is focus and thank uh, Commissioner Kessel um, for the almost year long amount of work that he's had to do to chair the COVID-19 um, task force. Uh, pe people probably don't understand enough about all the hours that he's had to put in and all of the work he's had to do to, um, you know, to, to deal with this. And so I do want to say thank you very much to Commissioner Kessel. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to close that public portion of the meeting. Um, I'd like to share a little good news on the uh, COVID front. Um, in a in several articles, and I've shared this with the administration, but I think that you know we've all got to be mindful that we might be getting a little better. Actually, um, daily cases have dropped 45 percent since the latest peak on January 11th, according to data from the COVID tracking project. Hospitalizations have fallen 26% since they peaked most recently on January the 12th. Currently, 44 states are seeing a decline in cases with just Alabama, Louisiana, Montana, New Jersey, Oklahoma, and Pennsylvania trending upward, according to John Hopkins. California has half the cases they had in December at their peak. New York has less than half the cases that they had uh, reported on January 15th. So um, whatever we're doing seems to be working. Um, let's just keep doing it and let's hope that it continues to get better. Anybody else wanna comment on COVID before we move uh, forward to the next item, Andy? Sorry, just 20 seconds. Um, Commissioner Kessel and I did speak about the COVID task force uh, and we, we at, the, at the staff level are gonna continue. Uh, we talk about COVID every day. So I'm, I'm communicating with Commissioner Kessel, things of that nature. So we're, we're still having it as a topic of conversation. It's probably the number one thing we talk about and, and staff has been excellent during this time, uh, responsive and done everything that, that we felt like we should be doing and we'll, we will continue. Thanks, Andy. Okay, uh, Tina. Yes, just really quickly, I, I would like to continue with the COVID task force and to have this, you know, discussed every um, meeting be because I think it's important to our residents to be able to speak about it um, and, and for us to talk about it and see what we can do to uh, help the situation. Okay, well, I think there's a consensus to do that. Nellie? Um, I'm, I'm fine with the COVID task force. I just do think that maybe we should put it towards the end of the meeting versus the beginning of the meeting, because like every, every month, we're now only doing these meetings monthly and look today, it's already 1030 and we have not gone through a lot of things that are important for our residents. Example, um, undergrounding, walkability, downtown painting, park purchase, kayak launch, all these things have not been discussed yet. Even um, the uh, master water plan that's on there somewhere, we're not gonna get to that. Now we have to discuss this um, blog thing and social media stuff, which I don't see how that pertains to our residents and how that betters our residents' quality of life, which should be our main concern versus talking about how we're gonna censor people here. So that to me is something that's unnecessary but, you know, I just, I'm not, not unnecessary, the COVID talk. I understand that that's something important and that you guys want to do it. But it's something that, look, we've already taken almost an hour of the meeting discussing things that we all know about. That's okay. all I want. Well, let's, if it's okay, let's move on. Uh, next item is uh, 9B, discussion of action regarding newly implemented town blog, Surfside Gazette and social media guidelines. Commissioner Salzhauer. Okay. Th thank you. So first of all, this is, I have to say, this is very important for residents. It's probably the most oh. important thing we can do for our residents is ensure that they're, they are getting accurate information mm -hmm. from their elected officials and specifically from the uh, taxpayer dollars that are being spent on some of these publications that we're putting out. Um, as I put in my the cover letter, social media has become a distraction and it's an ethically compromised forum for conducting town business. Open government laws and ethics make social media usage problematic. The town, and this can be a very quick item. This is not something that needs to be, you know, a, a, an all night event. The whole reason I came up with this item on here is because we've had some serious issues with credibility, et cetera, and statements that are made in some of these publications. And so, and there was uh, at the beginning when we got elected, there were some problems. There were some comments that were posted on other social media sites that were removed, people that were removed from like next door. There are posts that get, every site, social media site has people that moderate the content. It's a full-time job. It's a big expense. It's a huge overhead. They do it at, you know, at Twitter. They do it at Facebook. They do it on 
uh, next door, they do it everywhere. It's a very, very expensive proposition. In the beginning, when we got elected, I believe there was uh, one of the, the mayor specifically was trying to have the town create its own blog or own social media platform, which was uh, which would be a huge mistake and a huge expense because we would be forced to then monitor the content. We'd be responsible for the content. And then you would have the people monitoring that content being the people that technically work for us, which creates an ethical uh, problem. As we saw recently in DC, words have consequences. There is such a thing as truth. Everything's not an opinion. And specifically when you use your title, you know, Eliana, crazy aunt Eliana can say whatever she wants. But Commissioner Salzhauer needs to be truthful because there are laws that regulate that. And that's where I have, um, it's in the pamp. I need uh, Jose to share my screen right now. Jose, could you share my screen, please? Is Jose there? Yes, you are able to share your screen. Okay, great. Does everybody see the Citizens' Bill of Rights? No, you, yes. have, to, you have to share your screen. Oh, how do I share my screen on my end? To the bottom. You have to share if you move your mouth. Where does it say share screen? Sorry. It's a green screen in the middle. between It says participant chat, then share screen. Okay, I'm going to share screen. Here we go. Okay. Is this Bill of Rights in the uh, documentation that we received? It is, yes. Okay. Yeah, which three, page 323, Commissioner Velasquez. Okay, do you see now? Do you yeah. see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so the reason why this is up here is because there is actually a law already. This is part of the Miami-Dade County um, Ethics Committee here. There's a Citizens' Bill of Rights that says, uh, you see here, truth in government. No county or municipal official or employee shall knowingly furnish false information on any public matter, nor knowingly omit significant facts when giving requested information to members of the public. This is an obligation. This is a requirement, and this is the right of our citizens. So our citizens have the, the expectation and the requirement to get truthful information from their elected officials. So that, that means not opinions. Um, they have to get actual truth. So. It could be anything from the photos that we use to the comments that we make, and specifically to the summation or depiction of what happened at meetings. As we know, 99% of our residents, you know, right now there's probably maybe 15 residents that are watching this, okay? And every meeting, there's maybe sometimes 20, sometimes it's a bigger topic, but very few of our residents, when we have 6,000 residents, are actually watching the meeting. But everybody gets the Gazette, and everybody relies on the Gazette to be truthful. And unfortunately, what we had in the beginning and we still have are these uh, things that were not truthful in the Gazette. And what the town did to get around that was they put a disclaimer on the bottom because they don't want to be responsible for any lies that are told in the Gazette. But just because they put it, a disclaimer there doesn't let us off the hook. We have a legal obligation. We have a truth in government obligation to be truthful. So we can't say everybody opposed. It was unanimous. This is what happened when that's not what happened. And, I, and remember how a few months ago we decided to take away the cover of the Gazette from the mayor and he was going on about he's being canceled? I didn't even realize this. Another resident sent this to me. This is exactly what happened the last time around. This is a Herald um, article from 2009. In 2009, the mayor did the exact same thing where he used the Gazette to just badmouth the other commissioners and misrepresent what was going on at the meetings. And so they did away with the, with the mayor having the cover of the Gazette. That is not, this is long before cancel culture was a thing. So no one can say this, this is cancel culture. This is simply respecting the truth and the residents' right to the truth. Uh, back then, by the way, there was just the newspaper. The only way you could get your information out there was if somebody sent in a letter to the Miami Herald. So back here, you have someone here in uh, 2005 already saying, you know, not happy with, I guess, the mayor being the mayor back then, same mayor that we have now. This is, was your only avenue to, pub, to, to voice your opinion. Today, there's a million different ways to get your point across. A million different, you can have a website, you can have whatever you want. But the difference is, when you have a website, it has to be your personal website. It has to be, you know, Crazy Aunt Eliana's website. It can't be Commissioner Saul's Howard's website of slander. Then you have a problem because my name is not legally Commissioner Saul's Howard, the same way the mayor's name is not legally Surfside Mayor. But yet the Facebook page is called Surfside Mayor presents itself as a government entity and then posts 
whatever nonsense he wants to post that are not that's not accurate or valid. And this is a problem because it's uh, misusing the town resources, which is the Surfside seal, the surf the, the brand of the town of Surfside. It devalues that completely. Additionally to that, the town seal is protected. I can't just slap it on whatever I want. I can't send out an email using the town seal. We're not allowed to do that. And neither is the mayor. The mayor's not allowed to just take the town seal and put whatever in email information on that and send it out because residents get the false impression that it's actually communication, official communication that's been vetted by the town being sent out officially by the town. And that's not the case. That's also another clear uh, problem. And here you can see back in 2000, what year was this one? This was years ago, this was in 2007, the same mayor asked Robert Myers, who was the executive director of the Miami-Dade Commission on Ethics, there's a blog in Surfside, there may be others, can I participate, can other officials participate? And back then he was told by Bob Myers, by Robert Myers, that you can't do that. That if other elected officials are on the same blog and reading each other's comments, that could be a violation of the Sunshine Law. So this was set forward from the get-go. You know, the rest of us are all new to this. This is our first year, well, not Vice Mayor Paul's been doing this, you know, longer, but the three of us are new to this, but we didn't know what you can, can't, you know, this is all learning. We had the ethics class, we're learning about this, but this is, the, the mayor was already um, asked the question and got his answer. The problem is the mayor doesn't like the answers that he gets, but other towns have also looked into this idea of doing, putting together their own blog or their own social media stuff. And all of them have looked into it and said that any communications on any of these business, you know, city pages would be subject to sunshine law and creates all these sunshine issues as well. So this is, if you wanna look at more of the stuff that I have in the packet here, you can read about the attorney general saying that the use of a website blog or message board to solicit comments from other members of the board of the commission could come before the board would trigger requirements of the sunshine law. So there is, there is no, and it says here, while there's no statutory prohibition against members posting comments on a privately maintained website or blog, members of government boards or commissions must not discuss matters that could foreseeably come before the board. All of these items that we would be talking about would be items that are going to become before the board because the way that we get our ideas to present at meetings is from residents' comments. So to create something to, that will deliberately create a sunshine problem from the get-go is a mistake as well. You know, in time, no one's made, you know, since we sort of put the kibosh on this from the beginning and said, no, we're not going to do this, we haven't made any movement towards it, but I want to make sure that it's clear that we don't do this because this is a very dangerous thing to create another um, social media platform that can be used to put forth information that's going to be create sunshine problems and also create uh, ethical, you know, uh, truth and government issues where we're all on the hook for that because we can't make sort of half thought comments. And then and that also included in here are there's a couple of other so here's the Florida Attorney General advisory opinion from 2009 okay saying very specifically the city's under an obligation this creates anything that we create creates a huge obligation for records retention for moderating content for being responsible for the content because there have been cases in the past where someone threatened someone on a website and the website can be held accountable for not doing something about it for not calling the police for not saving a person. There's just, it just opens up a can of worms that we don't wanna go down. It's very, very dangerous. Again, I have no problem. Free of speech means you can put up your own crazy website and post whatever you want in your own name, but you can't do it as a commissioner. You can't do it as the mayor because then it's not fair. The other problem is in the Gazette, for example, right now there's a lot of problems. If you look month by month, and I don't wanna sit here going through every single issue of the Gazette, but we all know what we're talking about. What we're talking about here in every single, column, there are half truths and deliberate miscommunications and, and some are just actual actual lies. But I'm not going to sit here and go through month by month what happened. The point is you can't do that in the Gazette. Residents have a right to the truth. Additionally, because it's a government taxpayer resource, you can't be using it for political purposes. So you can't put your look at my website at Surfside 2020, which is my campaign website where I'm going to talk about why I ran for office and how I'm running for office. That is a misuse of town funds, that is it. That is an that becomes an actual problem. And again, whether someone wants to sit around and file ethics complaints, I started to do some of that. I am certainly happy to continue doing that. My goal here is not to get people in trouble. My goal is for there to be truth. My goal is for there to be a standard that we all agree to that we're going to be telling the truth, not that we're going to be using these publications for other purposes. So you cannot mention the the mayor. You cannot put on in the Gazette with taxpayer dollars 
look at my website, check this out, because then it's theft of services and you're using the town as your free publicity. Okay, you wanna buy an ad in the Gazette? Well, we don't take ad, we're not gonna take political ads, but you can't do that. That's that again, there are guidelines and there are restrictions on speech is not, uh, political speech especially, there are standards. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater and you cannot create safety problems. Some of the things that were being posted on the website, actually on your personal website, created a public safety problem to me, okay? I had to have a police watch order on my home. My son had a nervous breakdown over it. I mean, there were repercussions for that kind of, you know, slanderous activity that go beyond, I mean, aside from just not being something a decent person would do, those things have legal, legal consequences as well. So what I did was put together an entire packet here so that you can look at this over your own free time and see that this is clearly a matter that the state attorney general has already ruled on many times. Other cities have looked on that as well. Here is something from the city attorney's office um, where they asked, hey, what about us getting a Facebook page and website? And they spent all this time writing a whole opinion here, going through item by item about what the public records law would require, what the, the state attorney general requires, a sunshine law, the sunshine law problems. And they conclude at the end, this office discourages the city's participation in its Facebook page or any other similar interactive communication technology, okay? This is not something that they should be doing. Now, Facebook pages and websites for individual commissioners are also discouraged. If individual commissioners wish to have their own website, they should be for informational, informational purposes only or to solicit constituent opinions. They should be taking care to avoid posting position statements, okay, held by the commissioners on issues that may come before the commission. And literally every single post by, of the mayors has been on an issue that's going to come before the commission. Luckily, there's only, you only have two followers, one that doesn't even live in Surfside, so it's not been a problem. My point is that we shouldn't create additional problems and that we all have to be careful about this, okay? There is such a thing as truth. It's not a matter of opinion and it's not, uh, you know, words have, words have consequences and people have to be held accountable to that. Our social media policy for the town, which is what's here, needs to be, it, the whole point of putting this on the discussion item is two things. One is we wanna make sure that we don't create additional social media platforms that the town will be responsible for maintaining for um, from a technical standpoint and from a content standpoint. We don't have the staffing for it. We don't have the, we don't wanna spend the money on it. It's unnecessary when there are a million other, um, you know, it's not the days of the Miami Herald where you had to write in and get published. Everyone can have their own website. Everyone can send out their own emails. They just shouldn't be doing it as elected officials, okay? So I do think that the town, what I'd like to do is give the town attorney some guidance to strengthen our social media policy because our current social media policy has all these rules for town employees, but none of them apply to commissioners or the mayor. It's like they're, they can do whatever they want. And that's only from the town. Now, again, higher than the town is the ethics, higher than is the county. So there is this obligation, the truth in government that applies for everyone, regardless of what the town does, but I think as a matter of uh, procedure and as a matter of um, decorum, we should have a social media policy that adequately addresses this and makes it clear to the elected officials, to commissioners, to the mayor, to everyone, what they can and can't do posting wise. And they should be held accountable for the things that they post. Because again, if they're gonna be, for example, if the mayor wants to have a Facebook page, that's fine, but you cannot call it Surfside Mayor and identify as a government a government entity. It's actually posted on on the Facebook as government organization. That creates the false impression that he's actually speaking on behalf of the town as an actual government uh, figure. And that's not what's going on. This is his personal opinions. And he can have his own Facebook page that says, you know, Charles Burkett or, you know, Uncle Charlie's words of wisdom or whatever he wants to do. And each of us can do that. But when you wear your hat, when you wear your elected official hat, when you're a commissioner, when you're a mayor, there's a higher standard, okay? And that standard, like I said, is set by the county. There's a truth of government responsibility. And under that, there's all these things. Employees are expected to be attentive and careful of the use of social media. They should be aware. Employees should not post anything, okay? I mean, there's all these things. You should not post anything in the name of the town in a manner that could be reasonably attributed as the official position of the town without authorization, authorization from the town manager. So these things that are being posted on online as the Surfside government organization is not, it's not uh, authorized by the town manager. It's not authorized by the town at all. And it's not vetted and it's not true. And so it's unacceptable for that. And it's unacceptable for social media to be used like that. And it's not fair to our residents to get a gazette every month 
that completely misrepresents what happened at commission meetings. In the beginning, it was, you know, the mayor was taking pot shots at everybody. Now it's more targeted to me. Now every month it's a back and forth of him lying that, oh, I somehow uh, there's this false impression that he has that any dissent in town must be coming from me. That it's not possible that another resident might of their own volition, of their own, uh, you know, reasonable analysis of the issue, decide that they don't agree with him. And none of it is coming from me. I have been completely focused on doing my, staying in my lane and doing my job as a commissioner and focused on my family. I am not wasting time or spending time trying to discredit other people or spread lies about other people or anything. I'm just trying to stick to the truth. What happens at a meeting is very clear. There's a public record of it. There's a, there's a, a video of it online for people to look at. And it's not fair to the residents to misrepresent what happened, okay? I didn't single-handedly oppose this or single-handedly kill that, and neither did the vice mayor, and neither did Commissioner Kessel. And what goes on is in the Gazette is unbecoming. It's not fair. It's not fair to the residents. It's disrespectful of, of our roles as elected officials, and it needs to stop. So I do think that we need the town attorney to take a look at our social media policy and, and beef it up a little bit here so that it's clearer, you know, for us now and also for future commissions that how the responsibility that they have, okay? And I would urge everyone before they post in the Gazette or anything else that they double, triple check that what they're posting there is true. Because even something as innocuous as a picture of, you know, I know there was something that happened a while ago where there was a picture of a power lines posted and nobody, there were miraculously, someone had airbrushed out all the overhead lines when that's not necessarily accurate. That isn't, that, you know, was probably an innocent mistake. I'm not saying about something like that, but but specifically misrepresenting something on purpose, which is what's been happening lately, is not okay. There was never a unanimous vote. It's also another one. There's never a unanimous vote to read you the entire zoning code ever. I've been through every video over and over and over, okay? I've had other people go through all the videos. It just isn't there, okay? And what's happening is the, and this is honestly, it's just the mayor that's doing this. So I, and I hate to feel like I'm just singling out the mayor, but he's the only one doing this, okay? Is deliberately taking an issue and trying to make it a divisive issue and trying to make it sound like somehow he's the hero of the universe and everyone else is against him. And he's the only one who has these genius ideas. And that's not the case because I would never be able to single-handedly kill anything. You need three commission votes for something to get voted down. I am one person. Okay, I don't lead the charge on anything. I don't talk to other commissioners outside of these meetings. I don't have any contact with anybody, which is actually a shame because I used to be friendly with a few of the other commissioners, but now I don't even have any contact at all with anybody because I don't even want there to be a perception that there might be something going on. So I don't, I'm in my own house doing my own thing, taking care of my family and trying to stay on top of the town, the town business that I have to take care of. Okay, the mayor makes these endless public records requests so he can see, find things that aren't there. I'm happy to fill them, but it's not there. It's like chasing ghosts. My point here is I would like us to, as a, as a body, work together, okay, in the best interest of the town and not, it, this is not a campaign. I'm not running for mayor. I don't care about ever being mayor. This is such a waste of, of your energy, uh, Mr. Burkett, to spend all of your free time trying to like put me in a box or insult me or put me down. I have different views than you. I am just as educated and informed as you are. Just because I express my opinions at a meeting strongly and clearly does not make me a problem or a troublemaker or this. If you watch the meetings of your own behavior, you will see you mute people constantly. You cut them off. You're trying to you try to run these meetings like it's your own private dictatorship, and that's not what this is. Okay. For example, you can't spend a hundred thousand dollars of taxpayers' money rewriting a zoning code without us all talking about that first. You know, these are the things that are happening. But instead, you put in the Gazette. Oh, I'm trying to you know save Surfside, but Commissioner Salzhauer is ruined, or not even Commissioner Salz. Now it's Miss Salzhauer. Now you've even lost the commissioner, and next next month's Gazette will be Eliana did this, and I'm supposed to be Charlie did this. I mean, this is just this is devolving into into a big giant waste of time and we shouldn't even be publishing anything in the gazette if that's what it's going to be i think the residents deserve to hear only the truth or they deserve to be left alone but to be put in the middle of all this nonsense is unfair so that that, that was my point my motion here is that we do not i mean i know that we're not doing this anymore because i've asked constantly but i don't want there to even be the 
the idea that this could happen, that we would have create some kind of surfside social media platform that would be a nightmare, like I said, logistically, economically, and, and you know, content wise, legally would put us on the hook. So that's not something that we should be we should be doing. And I also want to ask the town attorney to take a look at our social media policy and see if she can bring it up to, you know, beef it up to be more in line with some of the other towns that I've looked at their social media policies that are much stronger. So that that sums it up. Thank you for your time. All of the material that's in here is um, in the packet and uh, available for anyone to review. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor. Mayor, can the commissioners, can commissioners have, sorry, stop sharing her screen? Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, Mayor, I, I need to ask you this, this question. Um, okay, this is from uh, Surfside 2020 website. This is, was from Nextdoor website. This is from the mayor's Facebook page. I'd like to just read the first two paragraphs. Okay, it says, this is from August 13th, uh, 2020. At our last meeting, elected officials Salzhauer and Paul brought the anti-democratic radical leftist cancel culture to Surfside, but why? Because they were upset that their votes to deny residents the right to decide whether Surfside's politicians get pensions, health insurance, and other goodies were exposed by me in the Gazette. Thanks to Charles Kessel and Nelly Velasquez, the greatest damage was avoided. Now, I would like to read you from the minutes of the meeting that the mayor refers to, which was the July 9th, 2020 emergency town commission meeting, where we were discussing the ballot questions. A motion was made by Commissioner Salzauer to not address the ballot question regarding leaving the dollar salary for commissioners, seconded by Vice Mayor Paul. The motion carried with a 4-1 vote, with Mayor Burkett voting against. It was voted on a second time. At the second time, it was a motion was made by Commissioner Salzauer to kill and not discuss the ballot question regarding salaries for commissioners, seconded by Commissioner Kessel. The motion carried 4-1 with Mayor Burkett voting in opposition. Mayor, what I'd like to ask you is, first of all, I didn't know what cancel culture was at the time. This was new in it appearing in the news for me anyways, and I had to look it up to see what it meant. Uh, on the initial uh, terminology of it, hearing cancel culture, I, I was just highly, highly, I, I don't even know how to describe it because I mean, I spent my whole life uh, working in, in the cultural field. I, I work as a photojournalist, I, I work in the arts and I mean, I'm, I have a 35 year career in culture. So to be called cancel culture, I, I, please just, I, what I wanna know is what do you mean by that? And do you still mean that? And please explain your terminology of cancel culture because I was highly, it's beyond offended. It, it's beyond being offended. I felt really personally uh, hurt by this. Well, you want me to answer that question? Yeah, I'll, I'll reserve my 30 seconds. All right, good. Yeah, cancel culture is a term that's being used today to basically highlight people that are getting, they're losing their jobs for what they say they're losing their ability to access uh, public uh, social media. They're being uh, censored, they're being shut down, and it's an effort by some to limit discussion, to limit um, opinions. And what we need in Surfside, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna give a little talk. I mean, uh, Commissioner Salazar spent 30 minutes and you know, I think that was nice, but there were some things I want to address, but cancel culture is something that you can look up. It doesn't mean we're trying to cancel your culture in photography. It has a very specific meaning, meaning it's a censorship effort on behalf of those who don't want to hear what others have to say. If, if I can, I, I, read, I read what cancel culture means. Why did you ask well, me? I'm asking you what you meant by saying that, yeah. directed that at us. And I just, just read you how the vote went and the vote was clearly not what you stated in the box. It was, it was, and I'll show you, I'll bring next meeting, I'll bring it back and show you. It was, you're wrong. Wow. You, you talked about pensions, you wanted to pay yourself, you wanted to give yourself goodies, you talked about health insurance. That was something that you were not against and you wouldn't, you wouldn't vote against it. Okay. I, I asked the other commissioners to weigh in on this because that is not true. It's not, well, listen, it's just not something that I think town officials ought to be even talking about. I don't think we're here to get paid. 
I don't think we're here to get benefits. We and weren't talking about that. We were. And if you can't vote against it, if you can't vote against it, that concerns me. But if anyway, you know, if you would like, I can read you the no, full minutes not, from that we, meeting. I think we not. We have other speakers. Great. You have 18 seconds. Would you like to finish? I'll reserve that. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so <clears throat> I take a very liberal view on um, on free speech and um, po the political um, domain. Therefore, I am totally fine with what's in the Gazette because it, it there's a disclaimer that says that this is not this does not represent the opinions of, of the, the opinion of the town um, necessarily. Which I, growing up and in my professional career, um, is enough for me. So I give permission for for various interpretations of what goes down even when it's what's, what somebody would, would, would be calling a rewrite, a reinterpretation, something that doesn't make sense, that may be considered of any one of us. Um, you know, now, that said, I believe in the, in the political process and that that will be weeded out over time if necessary or politically reinforced. Um, I'm grateful for Commissioner Salzauer's presentation um, because she has reminded us that um, that part of a citizen's bill of rights in this county is um, is truth. Um, I am against hyper monitoring social media because I think it's a lose lose scenario. Um, I think that um, that it's it's just impossible to be um, for the town as Commissioner Salsa represented and um, and argued and as I actually argued on the Taurus board when we were getting involved in, um, in media content from users and submi them submitting that to uh, a town run and operated platform. Um, if it were up to me, we wouldn't have the social media policy. We would just go with, it, with the law as it is. And these, these, this opinion does not represent the rights, but we do have the social media policy, it was written. And so I'm not gonna suggest we repeal it, but I think it's fine as is, um, you know, the residents want us to do things that matter. Um, and, um, and I know that personal feelings can be hurt by one thing or another. Um, it's not my way, um, so I try not to do it. Um, personally, I also don't take offense when others, in, when others intend to offend me because it's my choice to take offense. Um, but that's something that's very practiced. Um, I do, however, support the under truth in government because the town is now monitoring um, next door, which I don't know how it really got there to begin with because it's a private platform, which as Commissioner Salzauer said, um, you know, has its own checks and balances and rules that the town doesn't can't impact. But since the town is monitoring it, it has to be prepared for any one of us to say something that's outside the realm and correct it. Um, what if I was to say, don't evacuate during this hurricane is that my right? No, I would expect the town to step in, whoever's doing it now, and correct me. Um, so uh, those are the standards that I use, and it's less personal. Um, and I know my time is up, um, but um, I don't want to spend any more time on this issue, so I don't think I'll have any more comments. Okay, anybody else? Well, you, you just went for 30 minutes, Eliana. That, that was a that was a presentation that was submitted in advance. That yeah. was my yeah, comments so, well, on it. it. Was the actual you want to comment on your comments? Well, let everybody oh. else comment first, okay? Okay, I'll go afterwards. Nelly? Oh. Sorry. Thank you. I just want to point out example uh the beach ordinance picture. We're going to talk about misleading the residents. You're showing a picture of a bay, of a beach that no longer exists. That's misleading. Now, uh, how concerned are residents that, that residents sent me this particular email dated March third? I'm sorry, September twelfth. Your email through the must Surfside must not be sold. And your comments here are: um, I am very disappointed at some people that we support seem to have their own agendas and very and veering off course. The mayor in particular has turned out to be problematic and he seems to have two votes on every issue with Nelly. 
Okay, that's misleading the, 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 the residents, okay? And that's also part of truth in government. You're lying to residents, you're telling them your opinions. Example, another example. Let's talk about, I just wrote it here today. Just, just today happened. Um, and I'm happy that you brought this up. When you're talking about um, truth with your comments regarding your lack of experience and a, as an engineer, you're talking about, oh, a slab can't be um, uh, raised. Well, my house is not on a slab. My house has a crawl space and that crawl space is made of dirt. How can we raise my house? Yes, you raise the walls first and then you raise the floor. So yes, my house can be raised. So that's another uh, an untruthful thing that you're telling residents, okay? And there's many, many others. Example, I've heard from many residents of you calling them and sending them emails that you're telling them that we were going to redirect the traffic to Bay Drive. That's absolutely false. The, bay, the traffic was being right, redirected to Collins Avenue where it should be. So if you're gonna come here and request truth in government, I think you need to be truthful yourself and not bring your own particular opinions. As you say, they're not facts, they're opinions, which are not truthful. And that's not right. And residents do have a right to hear what people have to say. And I reserve my 40 seconds for later. Okay, I think we need a motion to extend. Uh, I'm also to extend. I would like to use my, I think I had 30 seconds. Okay. Well, listen, I think everybody's going to get to chime in again. I haven't spoken yet. I, um, do we have a motion to extend and for how long? Uh, for 15 minutes. Okay. Motion to, is there a second to that? I'll, I'll second that, um, but I'd like the, the clock to only be one minute for anybody that's talking. Okay, well, I have a statement and it's going to take me a couple more minutes than three minutes to read regarding this. We only get three minutes unless it's a presentation that was submitted in advance. No, I'm going to take a couple extra minutes. That's not how it works. No. That's my point. That's no, my you, point. You know, cut, cut, cut down. Does Why anybody, does only Eliana get to anybody object? Does anybody There's an agenda object? item that was a presentation that I submitted months Wow, 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 wow. Does May anybody have Object. Maybe can we get a vote for the extension of the meeting for 15 minutes? Yes. Um, call the question. Commissioner Castle? To extend the meeting 15 minutes? Can't hear you, Charles. Oh, Can't no. Hear you. no. Commissioner Velasquez? Uh, uh, no. Commissioner Sassauer? No. Good night, Mr. Mayor. Vice Mayor Paul? Uh, uh, it, it's going to lose no matter what, so no. Well, there's no motion being made here anyway, is there? We're well, done. Really. The meeting's over. Good night. That's, that's very nice, Eliana. That's good. That way, you see, canceled again. Yes, canceled it's, again. It's called accountability and truth. It's not well, canceled. Uh, actually, it's not because it I is. didn't even get my chance to speak. Oh, I, but now you know what it feels like, don't you? And you're happy with it. Okay. I sure I am. Heard? Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Oh, oh my Hi. Good night. Pick it up next week. That's not See you right, next time. Carl. We're allowing this to happen. See you next time. She month. have the right to say. That's what all right, guys. Said. Listen, listen. Right to say what she had to say. That's, that's all right, guys. I Come my on. Can I reach my mayor? Say yes. I would like to extend Sandra, this for a visit. What is it, Sandra? And the mayor to vote for his. his the, the. What is it, Sandra? Can I have your vote, mayor? Uh, well, I don't think it would be good for me to vote to cancel myself. I guess I'll vote. Uh, no, this is just for to extend the meeting. Yeah, I, I would have liked to have had a chance to respond, but I guess I won't get it. So I'll vote yes. Mayor, the motion fails. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you. All right. Motion to adjourn. And thank we'll you for pick the it up next month. Done tonight. Okay. Thank you.